Hey guys, here's the third compilation for this month. I want to give a quick shout out to my patrons. Christina De La Rosa, Noosh, Lulu Rogers, Fire 5 Linda, Shan, Jody, Sarah P, Kathleen Fenton, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Elena Renee, Monica Levelace, Alex, and Courtney Maxwell. Alright guys, enjoy the video. This is going to be a bit long. So I had a best friend in high school named Lena. We were friends for about a year and a half and would spend almost every weekend at our house, listening to music, watching scary movies and gossiping. She was just a little bit crazy. The type of girl to beat up her boyfriend's exes unprovoked, and catfish people. I say we were best friends, but actually it was more like I looked up to her, and she liked that she could boss me around and hang out with me whenever she pleased. She was extremely manipulative and two-faced. She had a hobby of being nice to girls at school, and then going on their social media and making fun of everything they posted. She would befriend people to just get their information from them. When we were friends, Lena was dating a guy named Nolan. They dated for about a year and a half. They had lots of trouble in the last six months or so. He would go out drinking most weekends, and she would cry in the middle of the night and blow up his phone, yelling at him and making him feel guilty. She was borderline psychotic when it came to his exes, or the girls that he was friends with. They just weren't really working out, but they stayed together anyway. At some point, Nolan got Lena pregnant, and one of Lena's other friends, whose name was Autumn, got pregnant at the same time from the guy I was in love with. Naturally, I wanted nothing to do with Autumn, but because they were pregnant together, Lena started hanging out with Autumn most weekends and neglected our friendship. After about a month, I became fed up with it and started ghosting her. At first, she tried to apologize but I was not having it. I was jealous and childish. So eventually, Lena got pissed at me and stopped trying. A few months went by, and Lena had the baby. Nolan and Lena stayed together to take care of their son, but their relationship was absolutely horrendous at that point. Lena cheated on him, and Nolan decided he wanted out of the relationship, but continued to see his son and buy things for him. However, Lena and Lena's mother made things very difficult for him by constantly changing the days he could see his son and refusing him to take his son anywhere besides Lena's house. Lena's mother would also throw out Christmas presents from Nolan, ignoring his phone calls and eventually told him he wasn't allowed at the house. Nolan begged for months to see his son, but it was clear Lena and her mother didn't want him in the picture. Nolan offered to pay child support, but they didn't want that either. They just wanted him gone. So he stopped trying, and apparently even that wasn't what they wanted. Lena took to social media to talk about how Nolan was a deadbeat. She told everyone she knew that being a single mother was really hard, and the baby daddy refused to take care of his kid. A year after they broke up, I met Nolan in person. We'd been talking online for a couple of months about Lena, we had shared stories about her crazy meltdowns and her manipulative tendencies, and we talked all about the time he came to her house while I was there and attempted to scare her when she went out the front door, but instead accidentally jumped out at me. He thought it was the funniest thing ever that my face stayed stone cold, and I just said, Sup. We had a similar sense of humor, and at the time, I had no one. I had just come out of one of the worst depressive episodes of my life. It had lasted for a good year, and I dropped out of school. I had been doing drugs, I isolated myself for weeks at a time, and I also considered ending it. He was the one to help bring me back from the brink. He was kind, and he was my support system. We were just friends at first. When Lena caught wind of our friendship, she reached out to me. At this point, we hadn't been friends for a year and a half. 
We caught up and talked about what had been happening in our lives. She asked what was going on with Nolan, and I told her we were just friends. Everything seemed fine. That's when her erratic behavior started. She would randomly block me on social media, and then unblock me about a month or two later. Sometimes we would talk, like, How are you? Everything good? And then the next day I'm blocked. At one point, I asked one of her friends to get her to tell me why she's doing that, because I was confused. So she unblocked me, and told me she was salty about the situation with Nolan, and the fact that I was friendly with him. I asked her why she kept making up with me, and then suddenly getting pissed again and cutting me off. I told her I was tired of thinking things were good, only for her to turn around, and pretend like we had never said anything to each other. That's when she said she could block me again, or keep me unblocked. Whatever I wanted was fine, but she felt I had done her wrong by abandoning her during her pregnancy, and then befriending her ex-boyfriend. So then I tried to explain to her why Nolan was my friend. I tried to tell her that Nolan was all I had in the darkest time of my life. I tried to tell her why neglecting me for Autumn hurt my feelings, but she wasn't having it. I understand where she was coming from, I do, and I acknowledge the fact that I acted childishly and in a cruel way, but I had tried to make up with her multiple times. I tried really hard, and she couldn't even stick with whether she could forgive me or not. So I told her to block me again and be done with it. She told me she wouldn't block me again, and then she gave me her blessing with Nolan. She said she was fine if we wanted to date and she said she hoped I had a good life, and I said the same to her, and I really meant it. We had a bad end, but I was glad we could at least wish each other well. It was a few months after I last spoke to her that Nolan and I started dating. I had waited so long because I was worried about Lena, even though we weren't friends anymore. But she had given me her blessing, and she was dating someone new, so I went with it. It was around this time that I received a friend request from a girl on Facebook named Casey. Casey said she lived in a big city in my state, and since we had mutual friends, and I had once gone to school in that city, I assumed we had gone to school together, and I just didn't remember her. She seemed like a real person. She claimed to work at Hooters, had made posts about how her workdays went, had several pictures of the same girl, and made frequent posts about her ex-boyfriend. I accepted the friend request, and she messaged me telling me how pretty she thought I was. I thanked her, and told her to message me anytime she wanted to chat. For the next few months, I was clueless. I went about my regular life, posting about things me and Nolan did, getting my GED, hanging out with friends, visiting my mother, that kind of thing. Occasionally I would see strange posts on my timeline from Casey, but didn't think much about it because I had over a thousand friends on Facebook, and I rarely saw them. They were mostly posts about how much she hated her baby daddy, and how her line of work sucked, but there were two posts in particular that caught my eye. One was a post that seemed to be referencing something I had posted the day before, and the other was of her saying, we all know a dirty hoe named Amber. So I went to her profile, and then clicked through the months and months of posts. Some were about her line of work, everything else was related to me and Nolan. Everything. There were posts of her complaining about her deadbeat daddy, buying things for everyone but his kid. Posts about how she felt about the breakup. Posts about how she missed me, and thought of me as a sister and some more about how I stole her boyfriend, and a myriad of posts shit-talking me. She made fun of my hobbies, and directly referenced me in some of my posts. Talked about how much she hated me, said I was a dirty hoe, and in her last posts, even went so far as to put my initials, or my first name in the post. She even had people in the comments egging her on, and talking shit too, even though no one knew who she was talking about. But I did. She mentioned things only the two of us knew. She referenced our past experiences. It was undoubtedly Lena. 
I messaged Casey and told her I knew it was Lena. She played dumb and told me the initials were of another girl she knew. When I looked up the name she gave me, not a single person on Facebook had that name. When I told her that, she brushed over it and tried to get me talk about Lena. So I played along. I talked hardcore shit about Lena. I lied about a lot of things, attempting to get her to out herself. But in the end, all she did was send a screenshot of our conversation to Lena's account attempting to make it look like Casey was real and was trying to help out Lena by showing her what kind of person I was. Casey then immediately deleted her account. She didn't block me, she deleted it. I had a friend and my dad check and neither of them could find Casey's profile. So then another month went by. I found out she had reactivated the account and because I can't block a deleted account, she was in my friends list again. She had access to my profile for who knows how many days. So I blocked her. She sent me a friend request and follow requests on three other websites under the name Casey, which I also blocked. It was around that time that me and Nolan began to get a lot of friend requests from obviously fake accounts. We would report them and block them and try to pretend she wasn't going insane. One of these fake accounts was extremely obvious because it had poked both me and Nolan on the same day, at the same time. She was taunting us, I guess. I blocked that account too. Please be aware that at the same time, Lena had married her boyfriend. She was doing this while married to someone else. A year later, I thought it stopped, and one day I went to the Casey account on my friend's Facebook because I wanted to see if she was still posting about me. And when I scrolled down, I realized I had missed a post last time. This post was Lena mocking the fact that my mother, yes, my birth mother, called her frequently to talk shit about me and give her information on me and Nolan. Turns out, my mother and Lena went to the same college, and my mother thought what better way to make friends than helping someone stalk my daughter. She would ask about mine and Nolan's relationship often. She talked shit about Lena and would act like the perfect mother to my face. She didn't raise me, so I didn't trust her 100%. For that reason, I never gave her my phone number, address, or any other information I felt was private. When my dog went missing, she tried to convince me to post my address on Facebook. She kept saying how important it was that people know exactly where he went missing from. What horse shit. Thank God I didn't, because I might have woken up to Lena punching my head in, or worse. For a while there, I was legitimately paranoid. Every time I went to the store or went outside, I was watching my surroundings closely, because if Lena was willing to beat the shit out of a girl Nolan had dated for three weeks, unprovoked, what would she do if she saw me in public? Would she kill me? I'd never met someone so obsessive. Let me just say, Lena was a horrible friend. She was manipulative, bossy, judgmental, rude, erratic, narcissistic, and two-faced. When I felt my first heartbreak, she spent all night talking shit about the guy, saying I deserved better. Eventually, I talked shit with her to make myself feel better. And what does she do? She messages him on Facebook and tells him everything I said about him. She guilt-tripped me about having other friends. She convinced me to abandon one of my friends just because she didn't approve of her. She would ignore me when there were other people around. If I complained about anyone, she would go tell that person what I said, even if she had said something worse about them. She would go through people's Facebooks and laugh at them and talk about how dorky they were. Not in a nice way. In a, this person is scum for being a bit dorky kind of way. She would make me feel ridiculous for liking things I did. I never felt like I could be myself around her. It amazes me how many people Lena has manipulated. Even her poor husband probably doesn't know she was a stalker. So yeah, there you have it. Lena cyberstalked me for two years, and if I had given my mother my address, 
it might have become actual stalking. She hasn't been trying to stalk me for a while now, and I cut my mother off and deleted all but 40 people off my Facebook, and made sure all my social media accounts are private, to keep this from happening again. I'm hoping I won't ever hear from Lena again. The last obvious sign I've gotten of her still trying to stalk me is a fake account that sent me a friend request about three months ago. An account that was a few months old, had the same last name as my friend, and only like two Facebook pages, one of which was a grocery store page, and the other was my page. My obscure Facebook page, my page that has spaces in between the letters, and Japanese letters in the name. My page that you have to either know the exact name, or have a link to find. My page that I already had to ban Lena and Casey from, because both accounts liked it. Sometimes I wonder if Lena is even trying to be secretive, or if she's just stupid. At least her attempts are few and far between now, so I don't consider her to be stalking me anymore. I was young when all this stuff happened and I made some really dumb choices. I know I'm not 100% faultless in this, and yes, me and Nolan are still together. We will be celebrating our four-year anniversary soon. Okay, let's start from the beginning, shall we? I work in the leasing office at a property in Texas. I also live on site. We have about 400 apartments and take up two sides of a street. I live across the street in the very back and try to keep to myself. I do not like for residents to know that I live there. About two months in, a woman and her two grown sons lease an apartment with us. The sons are twins. One is special needs. The other is, well, different. He has a very active imagination and is very focused on sex. Almost immediately after they moved in, things started getting weird. This is what happened in the first encounter. One day, I was crossing the street after work to go home. As soon as I reach the other sidewalk, I hear a voice call out. Hey yo, Raquel. I turned towards the voice, which I realized was coming from the bus stop at the end of the street. I didn't recognize who it was until I got a little closer. Who is that, I think to myself. We meet face to face and I realize who it is from when he moved in. I knew he was a little weird, so I was trying to keep my distance while still being polite. He's easy to piss off and I don't know what he's capable of but I don't want to make him think that there's anything behind the polite hello. He starts telling me that I look just like his baby mama who lives in North Texas, then jumps to a different subject about how he had just ran all the way from downtown to here. Then he decides to tell his entire family history, naming all of his cousins and homeboys, rambling on and on about essentially nothing. I hadn't said anything other than the standard O, oh, uh-huh, and okay. I keep taking steps backwards to indicate that I'm trying to leave, but he keeps talking and moving closer to me. As I'm trying to leave, I notice something very inappropriate. He was wearing basketball shorts, so it was pretty difficult to hide. This creeps me out, and I somehow managed to get away from him. He sat at the bus stop staring at me as I walked away, and I didn't want him to know that I lived there so I just kept walking down the street to make it look like I lived somewhere else. Every now and then, I would see him around the property, or he would come up to the office and talk to me, and it was very uncomfortable. The leasing office had a hallway leading to the manager's office, the copier, and the package room. There was a door on it too, which came in handy quite a bit. His visits got to the point where, every time I saw him walking up to the office, I would run and hide in the back and let the other staff deal with him. He wasn't creepy towards them and they knew the situation, so it was okay. Cut to December, our office was being remodeled, so we were using our business center as a temporary workspace. It is only one room, there is only one way in and one way out. There is no place to hide. 
I was alone in the office one day, and who should come walking in but my worst nightmare? He needed to borrow a copy of his mail key because he misplaced his, or he didn't have one, whatever it was. We have to take an ID in order to release keys, and he didn't have his, so we had to go to his apartment, get the ID, and come back. In the time he was gone, I set up my phone on my co-worker's desk and started recording, in case anything crazy happened, just so I would have the evidence. He noticed the tattoo on my shoulder and commented on it, asking, Is that your name, or... Why the hell would I have my own name tattooed on myself? I tell him that it's my grandmother's name, which sends him into this whole spiel about how he has his grandmother tattooed on him, and he's an artist and draws people's faces. He leaves to go check his mail, then he returns a few minutes later. However, when he returns, he's added something to his ensemble. He now has a pencil behind his ear, I suppose to make him look more like an artist. Then he said he was going to draw my face, but I have to send him a picture so he can look at the image of me. He said he would draw me and bring the picture to the office later that week. And just a note, I did not send him a picture. Months go by, no picture. I was walking through the pool to get to my apartment, and he catches me in the area. No escape. He presents me with, well, I don't really know what to call it. It's me, or I guess how he sees me. The picture was drawn on my notebook paper, in pen, and it looked like he threw it together in three minutes. He drew me black. I am white. It was me wearing a short, tight dress, not something I would wear. Legs two different sizes, carrying a purse with Texas on it. That is not an item I own. It was very creepy, and I keep it on my fridge to remind myself that I am not safe. Upon closer inspection of said drawing, I noticed that he drew nipples on it under the dress. I thought to myself, oh my god, did he originally draw it naked? The next day, I talked to the maintenance man about it. He says that he did originally draw it naked, but he decided to put clothes on it, because giving it to me like that would be too forward. On another day, I was walking out of one of the pool gates, and he was walking in through another. I saw him out of my peripheral, but didn't acknowledge him because, well, you get it. He says, Hey yo, Raquel, twice in a very low tone. I am hard of hearing, so I can get away with pretending I didn't hear someone. Apparently, this made him angry. The reason I know this is because he talks to one of our maintenance staff about me regularly. That person relays the weird, creepy, delusional stuff that he says about me. According to him, I was very rude, and he doesn't play that where he's from. The next few times I saw him, he had this deranged look in his eyes like he was disgusted by me. It also kind of looked like he wanted to hurt me. A few weeks go by, and he apparently gets over being mad, and he continues being the creepiest person alive. The maintenance man tells me that he claimed to have met my boyfriend, and that he's a cool dude so he's gonna back off. I asked my boyfriend if he had ever met him, he tells me no. The maintenance man tells me that he claims to have met my parents when they stopped in for a visit, and that they were really nice, cool people. I asked my parents if they spoke to or saw anyone while visiting me at work. They also said no. I don't know when or how he could have met them or saw them. I never saw him around while they were. I have confirmed by several people that were there that he was nowhere around. Does that mean he was hiding in the bushes? Recently, I decided to use our fitness center late at night. The fitness center has big windows that overlook the second pool on my side of the property. While I'm on the treadmill, which is in the front of one of these windows, he appears, staring at me through the glass, waving at me, watching me. I pretend there is glare on the window and that I didn't see him. He disappears into the dark shadows in the pool area and I continue my workout. 
The next day, the maintenance man tells me that he talked to our friend, and he could not stop talking about how he saw me in the fitness center. He went into detail about what I was wearing, how form-fitting it was, how sweaty I was, creepy stuff that gave me the chills. I avoid the fitness center and use my real gym to avoid seeing him again. A few days go by and my informant, the maintenance man, you get it, tells me that my stalker was wondering why I stopped going to the gym. Apparently, ever since that fateful night, he had been returning to the pool around the same time to wait for me, so that he could watch me work out again. He starts showing up at the office more frequently, and I have to avoid him. Friday, he's sitting in the pool area by the office, directly behind where my desk is. There is a huge window behind me. I turn to get something out of my cabinet, and I catch him staring at me. He waves. I flash a nervous peace sign and then proceed with my business. He is not in swimwear, but instead he is fully dressed. He has his notebook with him and is frantically drawing something. I think to myself, great, here comes another picture of me, but this time in workout clothes. My coworker went to put up the golf cart and close the cabana. She has to go through the pool area to do this so she got a glimpse of what he was drawing. It was a cross, with my name going down the middle. According to him, I asked him to draw a tattoo for me, so that's what he was doing, drawing a tattoo, for me, that has my own name on it. It's bad enough that it's a cross, but with my name, that would burn my flesh. He said he's going to give it to me the next day. The next day came, and he didn't show up. I'm not sure when I asked him to draw me a tattoo, but I'm pretty sure it was never. Two weeks pass, and I think that maybe he isn't going to give me the drawing, and enough time has passed that he gave up, and maybe I could use the fitness center again. My friend and I went around 8pm, and we didn't see any signs of him, so we go ahead with our workout. I was flipping over to do leg raises on my right side, which causes me to face the door. Chills engulf my entire existence and my heart stops for a second. He is standing directly across the street, on the phone, staring at me through the door. I start to panic and find a place to hide from view. Peeking around the corner, I see him turn and walk through the outside hallway behind the leasing office, his normal route to his apartment. Hoping that he wouldn't come back for a while, we continue our workout. I keep glancing out the window every few seconds to make sure he isn't there. He reappears, still talking on the phone, but this time he starts pacing around the fitness center very slowly, looking through the windows with his creepy ass side glance, kind of like I wouldn't be able to see him creeping. I keep hiding from view and I'm waiting for an opportunity to get out of there. I'm hiding in a corner and he walks up to the locked door and he knocks on it. He continues to knock for a solid three minutes, then finally leaves. He walks down the street a little way, and I take the chance to run back to my apartment as fast as I can. Today, my informant tells me that the stalker said I wouldn't let him into the fitness center for a drink of water. He said that he had just run all the way from Walmart, and he just wanted water but I wouldn't let him in. Then he switched up his story and said that he was trying to give me the drawing of the tattoo that I asked him for. Number one, he didn't run from anywhere. He was wearing flip-flops. Number two, he had been standing still for a good 30 minutes before coming to the fitness center. He had gone back to his apartment, where there's water. So why would he go all the way to the fitness center for water? And number three, he didn't have the drawing with him. He didn't have pockets on what he was wearing, and it wasn't in his hands. He also claimed to have talked to my neighbor that lives across from me, and he said that I'm a weird, crazy girl, and he should stay away from me. That shook me to my core, because if that is true, then he knows where I live. I knock on my neighbor's door and ask him about it. He says he has no idea what I'm talking about. Luckily, this Friday is my last day at the property.
So I eventually moved away from the place he was stalking me. I was positive that he didn't have any online presence. Because I'm naive. My online profile is private. And my profile picture is weird. So you wouldn't really know it was me unless I told you that it was me. Or so I thought. He tried to add me from his real account. And I immediately blocked him without a second thought. Then I got a request from someone else. My friend and I were chilling in my wine night room at the new crib, watching YouTube videos, having a good time. The Facebook app on my phone gives me a notification. It was a new request from someone unknown. That was suspicious off the bat. No one wants to be my friend. I click on the profile. It only has three photos, 14 friends, and out of that, None were mutual. I reverse image search the profile picture, and I get a generic stock image of a black model. Immediately, I suspect that it's him trying to catfish me. I send him a message saying, Hello, do I know you? And he responds, No, not yet. Nice to meet you though. I'm Daedron's big cousin. He told me you're a nice person. How do you know my cousin? I knew it, and I say to him, He stalks me. Can you tell him to leave me alone? It's not fun. He doesn't respond for an hour. I figure he was done, and block him for safe measure. I continue on with life for a week or two, and then I log into Facebook. I see a message request. The same person, but with an extra O on the end of the name. He is responding to my request to not stalk him anymore. The message says, Hi, I already told my cousin to stop doing that. He told me to tell you I apologize. I'm sorry. I never meant to do that. I don't mean you any harm. It won't happen again. Will you accept this apology? No hard feelings. He's a changed man now. Says he'll stay out of trouble. He doesn't do that anymore. Forgive him. It's not worth it. I block that person again. When he first messaged me, I called to file another police report, but they couldn't do anything because Facebook is public domain. I get it. I just need to add to my original report that he's still trying to contact me. When I was moving out of the old place, the maintenance guy that he talks to happened to drive by on his golf cart. He stopped and talked to me for a bit, and I told him that he tried to add me. He says, Yeah. He told me that he had his cousin hack your Facebook. I guess that's what he meant. After the first set of messages, I went by my old office to turn in my keys and to talk to my old co-workers. I was telling them the story, and the leasing agent says that he was talking to them about that. My stalker says he added me on Facebook, and we talked for like five minutes, and then I disappeared. He said that I had a black guy in my profile picture. And he didn't know that I liked black guys. And he's been trying to holler at me for a minute. Number one. We did not talk at all when he tried to add me from his Facebook. I immediately blocked him. Number two. There is no one but myself in my profile picture. Number three. He claims that he met my boyfriend a long ass time ago. Who is black. So wouldn't that be the indication that I like black guys. And number four doesn't mean I would be into you. You're still a psycho. The dude is crazy. I'm making sure all of my profiles are private and asking people not to tag my location. At this point, it's just kind of entertaining, but it's also unsettling. I will stay on my guard. I will be alert. I will not be one of those girls that gets herself hurt thinking she's safe. I will get video security. I will lock all the doors and windows. I will not be a victim. So back in 2017, my girlfriend and I were in a semi-long distance relationship. I lived in the Orlando area. She lived in Tampa. I would frequently travel with Megabus to Tampa to see her and for concerts. Shortly after this experience, I switched exclusively to Amtrak and didn't regret having to pay a bit more. 
On this day, however, I had picked up Wendy's before the trip for dinner. I had made my way to the boarding area. I noticed a disheveled older man glaring at me openly. I didn't acknowledge him and instead boarded the bus. I sat near the back of the bus, placed my lone backpack on the seat next to me, and opened my food. As I was eating, I noticed that the same man who had been glaring had boarded and sat across the aisle from me, in the seat closest to the aisle. Same as me. We had about two feet of separation. Well, the bus takes off and we're soon on the interstate, headed west. Every time I took a bite of my food, he would grumble. Then he started raising his voice a bit and motioning to me. Then he started near shouting and pointing at my wrapper. I had headphones on and I was comfortably ignoring him by this point. I had worked a full shift at work that day, had headed home, showered, changed, grabbed my packed bag, and headed out. So I was tired and hungry. As I finished my food, balled up the wrappers and tossed them into the bag, he became irate, shrieking in Spanish and reached over to me, grabbing the bag and looking inside. When he saw it was empty, he began screaming at me. I bluntly told him to shut up. It was my food. He went silent for a bit, until I saw him rummaging in his bag. He then slipped a hatchet out of the bag, laid it across his lap and smirked at me. My blood ran cold. I'm a big guy, six foot three, three hundred pounds. But in that small space, and dealing with a weapon-wielding maniac, I knew I couldn't do shit. I immediately stood up, walked to the driver and told him about what had happened. The next stop was Lakeland, and we were still about 45 minutes away. That was the only way he could do something. I went back to my seat, grabbed my backpack, and fled to the upper level, sitting close to the window at the far back. When we got to Lakeland, I saw him get approached and escorted off the bus. As he stepped off, he stumbled and fell, which is when I realized he was drunk. I'm glad he didn't get the opportunity to hurt anyone on that bus, and I can only hope he was detained after, or separated from his weapon. I live in a small studio apartment. I like my place a lot, even though it has some details that always made me nervous living here. The wall facing the street is just basically a giant window and I also live on the second floor, so my window is very close to the streets below. Even though that makes me a little uncomfortable, nothing ever really happened, and it just stopped bothering me that much a couple of months after I moved in. Until last week, that is. Last Monday, I woke up around 2am to drink some water. Since the kitchen is right to the side of my front door, I could hear someone coming in from the corridor as I filled a cup. It wasn't coming from another apartment or from the streets. The noise had that very specific reverberation from an empty corridor. I approached the door and could make out that the sound was actually some trap beat playing on repeat. At first, I thought that maybe it was just some drunk guy messing around with his phone before getting into his apartment. But after laying in bed again, I could still faintly hear the same beat coming from the corridor. It kept playing and playing until I fell asleep about an hour later. Around 7am, I was woken up by someone ringing the doorbell. It was a cop, a bunch of them actually. The landlord and some of my neighbors were also there. Even with the place very crowded, it was hard to miss the trail of blood that went from the corridor window to the far end of the wall. The cop said that someone was leaving for work early in the morning when they came across the blood smear and immediately called the police. He questioned me and the neighbors. The place was scrubbed and we went on with our lives, but I couldn't stop thinking about it. Every day I come home and walk over where the blood was, and I wonder what the hell happened in that corridor that night. I was a bit uncomfortable living here before, but now I'm very definitely spooked.
To start, let me explain myself. I'm 5 foot 7, 113 pounds, and I was 16 at the time of this encounter. I'm a multi-sport athlete, and I have insomnia. This all happened around 2 a.m. on August 10th of 2019. I had been over to my best friend's place because she had just returned home from a vacation and she had birthday presents for me. Hoodies and gummies if you're curious. I had spent almost an hour there already and wanted to head home as soon as possible because honestly, my town is scary at night. Drug dealers, murderers, you know the deal. So, I waved goodbye to my best friend and started walking down her street. I guess a party had just let up, because behind me, at the end of the road, about 20 or 30 yards from where I was standing, there were a couple of men walking across the crosswalk. They were both pretty tall, I'm guessing between 5'11 and 6'3. The two seemed harmless at first when I looked in their direction, but soon they came to a stop. They were both looking at me. At this point, I felt uncomfortable, so I just kept walking. That's when I overheard what one of them said. Hey, that's a girl. At this, I whipped my head around. They were starting to walk in my direction now, and one of the two men had moved over towards the sidewalk, where there was no light. I knew at this point that something wasn't right. I began to pick up my pace. They were still getting closer. I didn't know where the second guy was, but when I looked back, the first guy was still following me down the middle of the road. I think that they were planning to cut me off and try to trap me between the two of them. The minute I was about 13 yards from the T intersection, I started to run, and that's when the yelling started. Oh great, now she's running. I hooked a sharp right and then a left, and I could still hear them behind me, and at this point, all I knew was that I couldn't stop moving. I had to lose them somehow. I was coming up to an apartment building with a small parking lot behind it. There were no lights. I made the split-second decision to veer off into the parking lot. I squeezed myself under one of the cars. I don't know how long I waited there. It could have been a minute, but it felt like a lifetime. I watched two men run past. They didn't bother to check under the cars, which was definitely in my favor. The minute I felt that I was safe, I backtracked and took a different route back to my home. I was too scared to take the main route, in the fear I would have to bump into them. I know what I'm about to say is stupid, but I didn't go to the police. I wouldn't have been able to give a proper description of the man because I hadn't seen their faces. If there's anything I learned from my experience, it's that no matter who you are, you need to be extremely careful. You can think that the part of town or city that you live in is safe, but that really isn't the case. There is no protective barrier to keep out people with bad intentions. Please, whatever you do, watch your surroundings as if your life depends on it. If I had been listening to my music and not paying attention, I hate to think what could have happened to me. I hope that no one else has to experience the fear I did. It was almost like prey being chased by predators. This happened last October, while I was solo climbing here in Peak in Colorado. And every word is true. Before I left on this trip, I got an email telling me I had a bunch of raid reward points that were about to expire. My kit didn't really need anything, so I cashed them in on a badass Tanto-style survival knife that I never would have bought full price. I've been living with my parents all summer to help out with my mom's illness, so I was desperate for a bit of solitude, but I knew the trailhead sites would be crowded even late in the season because Huron is a popularish 14er. My car had terrible ground clearance, so no way in hell was I getting up to the 4x4 road to the trailhead anyway. I found a spot to park my car off the side before the road gets too rough, and hiked about three-fourths of a mile down. 
what I initially thought was a deer trail. Surprisingly, the trail ended at a prepared campsite next to a beaver pond, level dirt pad, rock fire pit, a few old beer cans. It's almost too perfect. I look around to make sure I'm not in a rancher's backyard or something, but there are no signs or structures visible, and grass was growing in the fire pit. Probably months since someone overnighted here, that's what I figured. Since it was October, it was already sundown, and by the time I got my hammock strung up and cooked dinner, it was pitch dark. The whole time I'd been using my new knife for everything, cutting lengths of paracord for the hammock top, opening my food. Hell, I was making up excuses to use this thing. I wanted to hit the trail early, so I started getting ready for bed right after dinner. I trek off into the woods a bit to hang my bear bag at a safe distance, but when I get back, my knife is gone. I was positive I had left it sitting on the edge of the fire pit, but I tear the whole side apart looking for it anyway. About halfway through, I start getting that prickly feeling that I'm not alone and that I'm being watched. Finally, exhausted and paranoid, I give up. I announce loud enough for anyone at the perimeter of my lights to hear, but quiet enough that it's plausible I'm talking to myself. Well, at least I still have a gun. I'm sure it sounded super lame, and it was a pure bluff. I had no firearms with me whatsoever. I pretend to lay down in my hammock and... After about 20 minutes or so, I hear what sound like faint footsteps headed in the opposite direction of me, down the trail back to the road. I spent the entire night, wide awake clutching at my shitty pocket knife. At first light, I break camp and shove everything into the car, then drive my poor car as far up the 4x4 road as I can. I didn't want to have to come back here. It was a beautiful day. I summited ahead of schedule shared lunch with some friendly fellow hikers, and almost forgot about the whole ordeal. As I walked back to the car, now parked about four to five miles from where I camped, I noticed there was something stuck under the driver's side window wiper, like a parking ticket. It was my knife. There's only one person I've met in my life that I'm absolutely positive was a psychopath, and it was a ten-year-old little girl. This summer after I graduated college, I was living in a house in Berkeley with a few PhD students. It wasn't the best neighborhood, but it wasn't the worst either. There were a few families living in the neighborhood, including the people in the house next to us. It seemed like a reasonably nice two-story house. But on several occasions there were police cars and ambulances outside of the house. We never really questioned why. As police cars weren't a rare sighting in the area, and we'd only ever seen a young girl and her mom at the house, so there was nothing overtly abnormal or concerning. One afternoon, my roommates and I had just finished smoking a joint in our backyard, when we hear a knock at the front door. I open it and it's the mother from next door. I was a bit taken aback, even more so when she says, Hi, I wanted to ask you guys something. I really don't want to have to call the police. At this point, I'm thinking she must have seen or smelled a smoking weed, and while it was Berkeley, it technically hadn't been legalized yet. So I'm thinking we need to apologize and talk our way out of trouble, but then I notice this woman is visibly shaking. She was clearly terrified and said, I just don't know what to do. I'm having a situation with my daughter and I really just need another adult to be there. My roommate Sean and I immediately agreed to go with her while my other roommates look on. Incredibly confused by whatever the hell is going on, this mother is asking some stone students to be adults. She must be truly desperate for help. Sean and I walk over with her, and she explains that her daughter has some issues, which are currently manifesting as her standing on the roof of their house, threatening to drop her mom's work computer off the edge, or jump herself. Wow. 
shit just got super real. Sure enough, we walk up to the driveway to the house, and there is this kid standing on the roof of their two-story house, dangling a MacBook Pro over the side. She sang in this disturbing, sing-songy voice, Look, mommy, no hands. No hands, mommy. No hands. Sean and I immediately make eye contact. We are both creeped out. This is not a normal kid. The way she is speaking reminds me of the twins from The Shining. She's not crying and doesn't seem remotely distressed. On the contrary, it appears she is enjoying this torment of her mother like it's some kind of sick game to her. The mother starts explaining to us that her daughter has had issues like this for many years. She has a psychiatrist and a therapist, and the mother has called both. They recommended calling the police, but the mother has been through this quite a few times before and doesn't want the child to go through the ordeal of being restrained and taken to hospital yet again. She is frightened and exhausted and doesn't know what to do. So I just start talking to the kid. I tell her about how I used to love climbing on the roof of my house, and now I'm into rock climbing, and I bet she would love that too. Besides, it's much safer than climbing around the edge of a roof, if you make sure to use the proper gear and safety precautions. And the fact that she's so unsafe right now is really scaring her mom. I told her if she comes down, I'm happy to talk to her more about climbing, as well as show her the pet geckos we have that literally climb up the walls. I'm just pulling things out of my ass at this point. I have no idea what to say or how to mediate a situation like this. I am just trying to diffuse the tension and get her to come down. She is flat out ignoring me at first, continuing to taunt her mother, but eventually she seems to get bored or irritated with my attempts to engage her. She turns around and climbs back towards the window where she got onto the roof. She runs down the stairs and out to meet us, then says in the same weirdly, sing-songy fake, come play with a Stanny voice. I dropped your computer on the roof. And now it's broken. I'm sorry, mommy. Do you forgive me? There was zero remorse whatsoever in her voice. It sounded so disturbing and manipulative. I was blown away that it was coming from a ten-year-old girl and not some demon child from a horror movie. The mother is still shaking and just looks overwhelmed, so I offer to go up and get her computer from the roof. She agrees and escorts me through the house up the stairs with her daughter trailing behind. The girl is clearly irritated with me spoiling her game and repeatedly orders me to leave. I ignore her, climb out the window onto the roof, and the laptop is sitting by a gutter, seemingly unscathed. I climb back through and hand it to the mother. At this point, the girl realized her bluff was called and skipped off to her room. Her mom proceeds to explain to me that the whole thing was triggered by her changing the password to her laptop after the girl logged into it, stole her mother's credit card, and ordered over $2,000 worth of stuff. This girl is 10 years old. She's been pulling stuff like this her entire life, and no one understands why. They had to move the girl's younger sibling into a separate apartment with her father because they were afraid she would hurt him. The mother was crying at this point, saying they really tried their best to get the help she needed, and they're just at their wit's end. I did my best to reassure her, gave her my phone number, and told her to contact me if she needs help in the future. Sean and I got out of there and went back to our house. She never contacted me, and we moved out a few months later. This happened about a year and a half ago. I was at work, and I ordered DoorDash for myself and my supervisor, since it was her birthday. I was happy to see I had the same driver as last time, as I work in a small building among other identical buildings, with a convoluted road system in between them all. It can be a little confusing for someone not used to it. I had been watching the map and went outside once he was close by. 
and I stood under a cluster of bright lights into a parking lot, wearing neon yellow. You couldn't miss me. Immediately, I get a call from my driver, asking me to come to him. I look around and don't see anyone, until I walk a couple of yards to the center of the lot. He's sitting on the side of my building by the dumpster, where there is no light. He also has his lights off. I'm thinking what the hell dude. I start waving my arms and telling him I'm in front of the building. He's on the side. He hangs up and just chills there for a minute. At this point, I'm really annoyed because our food is getting cold and this guy delivered to me in the exact same spot a week before. Finally, he turns his lights on and comes over to me. As soon as he pulls up, He's speaking another language into his phone, which then translates to English. Something like, Hello, I am practicing my English. I need new friends. Will you be my friend? And then puts the phone towards me. I feel like I'm speaking to a child, because this isn't appropriate. I just say, Oh, that's a cool app. And I look at him, waiting. He keeps speaking into the app about needing friends, and I tell him my supervisor is waiting for me. I reach out my hand for the food. He tries to touch my hand and then asks for my number. At this point, the fact that he had tried to get me in the dark, plus his persistence, turned my growing annoyance into fear. I tell him I need the food, and he asks me to get into his car in perfect English. Thank God at this moment, someone in my sister building comes out and makes their way over to the lot. He finally gives me my food and scurries off, which freaked me out. Why, after all that, would he speed off at the sight of another person? Clearly, his intentions were not good. I reported all this to DoorDash at the time, as well as my local police and on social media. And it turns out, He'd done this to someone who lives two miles away from me. She had also ordered late at night, and he apparently asked her if she lived alone, and if they could hang out while holding her food hostage. DoorDash assured me that they had deactivated him, but his boldness, plus the fact that he seemed to only drive late at night, makes me think he does this a lot, and has probably already assaulted someone. So when I was a kid, around 6 to 14, my family and I would often travel to a city, about 38 miles away from our small town, to visit family friends, go shopping, or occasionally visit a few properties that my father owned. One of them was a small house that was previously inhabited by my aunt and her family. One day when we were visiting the city, we were staying at this house for a few hours, as my dad had to conduct a few business deals. My mom wanted to visit a friend, and I wanted to buy some new games. After we were finished, we gathered our things, got in the car, and drove back home, just like usual. Well, about a quarter of the way home, my dad realized he forgot his phone back in that house, so we turned around and drove back. At this point, I was playing games on my mom's phone, because I was bored and had nothing to do. Then, for some reason, I just decided to repeatedly call my dad's phone with my mom's. They told me to cut it off since it was annoying, but being the rebel that I was, I kept calling until they just ignored it. It was not until the car was right on the driveway that my mom asked for a phone back. One more call, I said to her. Fine, she said. So I did just that. And then, hello, I heard answer from the phone. It was feminine. I didn't recognize it. My dad's phone was inside that house that he was currently unlocking. Shocked and confused, I hung up. My mom saw me and asked what was wrong. And so I told her what happened. She rushed to my dad, grabbing me by my arm. Someone's in the house, she whispered to my dad. Immediately, he opened the door 
and we rushed towards the house. But it was empty, and my dad's phone was in the bedroom that was also locked with the key that only he had. We checked the phone for the missed calls that I made, and considered the possibility that I might have called someone else for my mother's contacts. Turned out that the final call I made had been answered by that very phone. My mom and dad searched the entire house for a possible b and &E. They concluded that everything was in order, and there were no signs of forced entry or anyone else in the house besides us. We decided to just leave it behind and go home. My dad justified it by saying it was a thief. There was barely anything to take from there, besides an old TV. If it was a vagrant, then it wouldn't be his problem anymore in a few months. We actually kept that house until I turned 23, and I spent three years living there until I moved out to get my master's degree. To this day, I still don't know who the hell that was, who answered the phone, why couldn't we find them? Well, I suppose I'll never find out. As a young woman who lives alone, I tend to be cautious when it comes to who I open the door for. One evening some time ago, I ordered in some food, and as usual, I requested it to be left outside, as I prefer no contact. So when the guy shows up, he has no problems finding the right place, and I go out to get the food. I get bad vibes from this dude quickly. He waits a few seconds before he hands over the food, and while doing so, he looks me up and down. Then he said, Bet you live alone because you didn't order that much. He said this in a joking way, but I just said nah, then went off into my home and locked the door twice. I was a bit creeped out already and decided to peek outside to see if he left. He hadn't. The delivery dude stood there for a good couple of minutes, checking his phone a bit and also just standing around. He leaves and I relax. Then comes the first call. I can only hear very slight breathing on the other side. No one is speaking, so I hung up. Then there was a text. When can I come over and kiss you? Another call. No one speaking. I check out the number from the delivery app, and of course it's the creepy delivery guy. Another text asking if I want company tonight. So I blocked the number and tried to contact the delivery company. No luck there. Then I'm getting a call from a hidden number, and it's the same thing. No one speaking on the other side. Now I'm terrified. So I called the police, of course. They showed up pretty quickly, and I showed them everything. They took my statement and went on their way. After they left, I didn't get any more calls or texts but I'm still weary of delivery guys. I did eventually manage to get in contact with the delivery service the next day. I told them what happened. By then, I had already contacted the police. I asked them how this could happen, and the only explanation I received was that the app requires a number to be registered, and that this person most likely just took it from there. They apologized and said they would deal with it. Whatever that meant. I have no idea how or why this guy also used the delivery phone for some nighttime harassment. So I just want to clarify, I was 15 and home alone. I lived on a Native American reservation at the time. Shit would happen all the time. Hearing things. Walking at night you would see shadows. That kind of creepy stuff. The kids would call them skinwalkers. This was during the day. My mom was at work. And as for myself, well, I dropped out of school due to a medical condition. So I had this huge window in my room. I'm talking wide. And it took about a whole section of one wall. Just enough space to fit a vanity and my TV on both sides. I was chilling, smoking weed, walking around my room. I showered at one point, so I got changed. All while a man was sitting on a wooden post, directly across from my backyard, watching me. 
I didn't have curtains. When we first moved in, they had huge ugly blinds hanging up. I tore them down and put up really cool blankets. During the day, I would tie them up so light would come in. Arizona is a beautiful state, so to see desert every morning along with the sunrise is amazing. Hours pass and my mom comes home. We head to Taco Bell. I vividly remember being on Twitter in my room, eating my cheese dias, when all of a sudden the light in the hallway went off. So I figured it was my mom, but then my door opened slightly. My mind was racing at that point. It was about 9.30 at night. My lights were off in my room. The only light was coming from my phone. I start calling my cat's names. We had three of them. And that's when I see him. A tall man. A red baseball hat and jeans. I was going through a hard time, so I had a depression fit and started screaming and throwing hangers. Empty soda cans. Anything I could get my hands on. And I scream for my mom, who was home and in the room next to me. She comes out, flips my light on, and there is no one there. I tell her I'm calling the police. There was a man in my room. So my mother gets a switchblade from her room and walks me through every room upstairs until we look down into the living room from our balcony and see the blanket from our guest room on the floor. That's when my mom looks at me and says to stay back. Being that it was my mom, I held her hand and we end up downstairs in the office room, where the window was wide open. To cut to the end, the man was arrested breaking into another home, and when asked about me, he was ready to take me, kidnap me, and he was watching me. The neighbors called 911 because they saw him trying to get into our gated backyard. My mom saved my life. If she wasn't there, I don't know what would have happened. So, I'm home alone. My mom's out visiting family and picking up some stuff. I'm chilling, playing Animal Crossing with my dog Ty, laying on my bed, keeping me company. Ty suddenly bolts up, hackles raised and growling. I heard someone downstairs shout, Hello? And me being stupid, I shouted back. I went downstairs to see two guys outside, looking in through the window. So I went and opened the door to see what they want, since I was expecting a parcel. They immediately started with, Hi, we have a warrant for the electricity meter. And I immediately felt off. You don't get a warrant to check an electric meter, so I did the only thing I could think of. I told them I was underage and home alone, with Ty watching them through the window. I said I'd call my mom, and I shut the door and tried to lock it. But I couldn't. The key wouldn't turn. So I called my mom. I explained what was going on and I barricaded the door so that no one could move the handle down. After a few minutes, I managed to turn the key and lock the door. I went upstairs to check the cameras and lo and behold, it showed three men standing outside the door, occasionally looking at the camera and trying to stay hidden. At one point, you can see two of them enter the house, then run out and quietly shut the door. This was the time when Ty went running down the stairs. As I kept watching the playback, I saw the van door open and shut, so I think that there were four people. I have no idea who these men were, or how they unlocked the door, and I'm never going to open the door without a weapon nearby. Later on, my mom came back and watched the footage. They brought a dog bar. The one stray catchers use with a long bar and snare at the end of it. She suspect they picked the lock on the front door, so I couldn't lock it and that they could get in. She found the number on the van. The following day, my mom called the company number on the van and ripped them a new one. She thinks they were here to install a pay-as-you-go meter for the electric, but nothing has been touched or moved. Ty stayed in my room with me that night and helped me get some sleep. First, let me say that my mama was a mama bear. 
probably a bit overprotective. But as we were entering the era of Adam Walsh, who could blame her? She kept a close eye on me and my sister. She was so protective that I found myself shrinking whenever there was a moment that I should have used my voice. My mama was my voice. This will come into play later. This particular Sunday, I was about eight years old. We drove to Shreveport to pick up my grandma and take her out to lunch. We only lived an hour away, and we usually did this once a month. Our routine included lunch at Piccadilly in the mall, and then shopping and looking around. My favorite store was Hallmark, not for the cards, ironically. I love to look at the trinkets, journals, and ornaments. My mom knew this, and so allowed me and my sister to go in. She and my grandmother would sit on a bench right outside the store, where she could look in at us through the glass. I had just walked in and was admiring the ornaments halfway back in the store when I heard, excuse me, right behind me. I turned to see a boy, maybe 10 to 12 years old, standing behind me. Hi, may I ask you a question? He asked. I remember even at my young age that the boy was very well spoken, almost like a salesman. His accent was not from the South. He sounded Midwestern or possibly Northern. The boy in general would not have been strange, except when I looked at his face. He had a black eye, lacerations on his cheek covered with a band-aid. This boy had been beat up severely. He must have saw my shocked expression as he immediately said, Yeah, I'm sorry about my face. I was in an accident. He then quickly goes on to ask if I could help him find a card for someone's birthday for him, or something to that effect. I remember turning around and looking outside at the bench towards my mother. She was in a conversation with my grandma. My sister had already left Hallmark and was sitting beside my grandma. I willed my mom to make eye contact and come be my voice. No, she was too focused on a conversation. I turned back around and meekly said, I... I don't know. He must have noticed the look in the direction of my mom and my hesitation as he said to me, It's okay, you're safe. My mom is right back there. He points to a woman with her back towards us, looking at cards, pacing a bit. He says, The cards I'm looking at are right back there with her. Come on, it's okay. Come on. In retrospect, I can hear the desperation in his voice. I took two steps toward him, and when I did, I noticed that the woman was standing next to a door. I had that gut fear about almost everything back then, but this moment, my stomach was in my mouth. I remember wondering where that door led. Every one of my hairs stood on end. He would take a step back and say, Come on, it's okay. It's okay, really. Almost like I was a puppy he was trying to wrangle. I was only eight years old, but there was more desperation in his voice now. There was fear. Something wasn't right. We were about eight steps from his mom now. I immediately turned toward the mall exit and threw out a very frightened, I've got to check with my mom. I remember the, with my mom part. I was already out into the mall and headed towards her arms. I was in her lap in 10 seconds. She asked if I was okay and I just said, yeah, that boy was trying to talk to me. We both turned to look and the boy was looking out through the glass at us. As soon as he noticed my mom looking, he pretended to turn and look at cards. My mom just said, Okay, you're okay, and turned back to my grandma in conversation. It was true. I was okay then. I think she just thought I was being shy and scared. I saw the boy go back and talk with the woman. She did not look happy. I could just see fear coming off of him. She sent him back into the store and turned back towards the cards, still standing near the door. In my adult brain, 
I realized she was off, just like the boy. She was pretending to look at cards. She would occasionally glance back at the boy. I saw him go up to a couple more people and talk. I can't remember if these were kids or not. This could have simply been a situation where she was trying to get her son to open up and approach others in conversation. But everything in my gut tells me that she was using the boy's bait to abduct other kids. And had I gone back there with him, they would have tried to usher me out through that door and into a waiting car. And then maybe I would have been bait in the future. I never told my mom about the entire incident. I knew her. She would have said, Honey, you should have said this to him. Or, you should have come and gotten me. I was always ashamed that I would chicken out in moments like that. I wonder often what happened to that boy. I can still see his face. Dark eyes, dark hair, clothes slightly disheveled. I remember looking on the news to see if there were any abductions, but I also remember his accent. He wasn't from our Texas, Louisiana area. He could have been taken from anywhere. There were no Amber Alerts back then. Little beat up boy in Hallmark, I remember you. I wish I would have used my voice to possibly save you. I'm sorry I was too scared. I hope you are safe. I met my stalker when I was in middle school. My school consisted of 7th grade through 12th grade. It had a normal program and an accelerated program, with the students in each program being segregated. My friends and I belonged to the accelerated program, but there was only one guy in the group from the normal program, Carson. All in all, we were typical teenagers, with Carson being the group's prankster. We could only hang out at school because we were shipped in from various parts of the country for the accelerated program. So after school, we would all get on AOL to chat and play games. Online, we had even more friends as we'd invite our own local friends to also chat with us. One day, Carson invited his friend Steve to join the chat. He was nice and contributed a lot to our conversations. We learned Steve actually attended our school, but he was in the normal program and had a different lunch period than the rest of us, so we had almost no chance of crossing paths. We insisted on meeting him, however, and scheduled for Steve to come over to my locker before first period. The next morning we waited, and Steve never came. My friend and I did have a short exchange with another kid, Marco, which consisted of us telling him to go away. Marco had been Carson's satellite since the beginning of the year. Wherever Carson went, Marco would stand 10 to 15 feet away, just watching us. We had tried being friends with him, but he was simply too strange for us. He would touch your face unexpectedly, or try and sneak up behind you to bite you, or tell you he wanted to see you inside out. His list of strange behaviors was a mile long. A few days after Steve failed to come meet us, it came to light that Steve was really Marco and that the whole thing was one of Carson's pranks. Considering Marco had been a pleasant addition to the chat as Steve, we gave him another chance to join the real group. Besides Carson, I was the only person that really gave Marco a chance. He still did the weird things he had always been doing but it was now apparent that it was all an act to get attention for being the weird guy. Marco was being abused at home by his mom's boyfriend. He rarely saw his mom because she worked so much. Marco was the poster child for bad attention is still attention. Still, my friends wanted him out of the group, and I repeatedly found myself arguing his case to let him stay. Once, I caught an older student beating Marco up. Being much larger than either of us, he was literally picking Marco up and slamming him into the lockers while he called him a freak. Knowing the bully and his mother, I did what my signature move was at the time and kicked him in the balls 
while threatening to tattle to his parents about how he was treating me and my friends. I believe this was the catalyst for years of torment, as Marco became my satellite after that day. At school, Marco followed me any chance he got. At home, Marco messaged me non-stop, typically in private chat, as my other friends wanted nothing to do with him. I felt bad, because he was a sweet kid, besides his attention-seeking stunts, and no one should have to go through life with no friends. Eventually, Marco asked me out, which I politely declined. He was my friend, but he was not the type of guy I would ever be interested in dating. He was persistent, begging me to give him a chance. Over and over again, I would have to tell him no. One day, his approach changed. You will go out with me, or I'll show your mom all of our chat logs. There was nothing especially bad in those logs. I wasn't drinking or doing drugs or really anything bad, but I was pretty depressed at the time, and I sometimes talked about ending myself. If my parents saw that, I could effectively kiss my freedom and privacy goodbye. I bluffed him, telling him good luck with any attempts to convince my parents to believe him over me, and that seemed to work. I wasn't very impressed with the stunt and stopped talking to him. A few weeks went by and Marco came crawling back, begging for forgiveness. I eventually caved, allowing him back into the group. At first, he was well behaved again, but slowly he started pestering me to be his girlfriend. Over the course of high school, he tried many different methods, begging, blackmailing, attacking my self-esteem, catfishing, threatening any guys I dated, threatening to end himself, and more. I tried to be nice at first, but eventually had to get pretty mean in how I said no. His behavior would always reach a boiling point that forced me to cut him out of our friend group. It was nearly impossible to get rid of him, however. Online, he would create dozens of new accounts to send messages from which overwhelmed my attempts to block him. He would call my phone all night long and leave woeful messages about how lonely he was and how he would end himself if I stopped being his friend. He would show up at my house and stand outside my bedroom window randomly. When my parents had parties, things like the 4th of July, Thanksgiving or Halloween, he always managed to find out and show up. Their parties were always pretty big, with an open door policy. So, he'd slip in. He'd then ultimately do something to get thrown out, like getting belligerently drunk or stuffing his face with finger foods and then put them back on serving platters. The first time that I felt Marco might actually be a threat was at one of my parents' Halloween parties when we were 16. One of my dad's friend had a son our age, Tim, that was a bit of a jerk. He fancied himself pretty cool, and thought it would be fun to pick a fight with a weird kid to make a display of his own superior strength. Marco accepted his challenge. We all knew he was about to get the shit beat out of him. Going out into the streets, Tim towered over Marco. That year, Marco was dressed as Alex from A Clockwork Orange. His costume included a cane. He swung the cane at Tim, hitting him in the head with it. Tim went down quickly and Marco beat him until an adult intervened and sent him home. Marco's go-to threat whenever I had a boyfriend was, I'll beat him to death with a shovel and then use it to bury his body. Suddenly this threat seemed like something he'd be capable of. Our senior year of high school, Marco's dad died in prison. He learned the real reason his dad was in prison was for murdering someone. He'd always thought his dad was in for drugs, and Marco started to spiral out of control. He said his dad was a murderer, so he must always be doomed to be a murderer. He dropped out of school halfway through the year. My brother said after I'd left home for college, Marco came to the house looking for me a few times. Once he figured out I wasn't there, he'd just come and stand in the front yard aimlessly, playing with a big lighter, until someone threatened to call the police. 
One of my biggest worries was that he'd try to set their house on fire in some weird way of trying to punish me. When I'd go home with my boyfriend, he'd always show up at my parents' house. At one point, he tried to intimidate my boyfriend into breaking up with me by showing him he had a hunting knife. It was always a big ordeal getting him to leave. A lot of the issues have now eased up due to the distance and time. I don't use social media anymore, and I'm able to semi-block people on my phone. Initially, he was calling and texting me every day, hundreds of messages. I tried asking him to stop, but this only encouraged him. My family no longer lives in that area, so I'm significantly less worried for their safety. I found the most successful way of dealing with Marco is simply ignoring him. Eventually his messages dwindled down to once a week, then once a month. Now, I may be here from him officially once a year. His message is typically something along the lines of, Please, just be my friend. I won't try for anything more. I need you in my life. The last time I actually talked to him, which was about four or five years ago now, Marco tried to tell me I ruined his life. He said I'd put some spell on him, that he couldn't move forward with his life. He told me he would end himself and it would be my fault. I finally had to tell him that I wouldn't care if he did that. In fact, it would be a relief. His most recent M.O. is to call my work phone from a private number, just to hear me answer the phone and then hang up. He also calls and texts my brother, our high school friends, my brother's best friend, my parents, my grandparents, my aunt, and my husband to beg them to ask me to call him. Marco messaged my husband, saying to him, Tell her she is my angel, the love of my life. I am nothing without her. I'm worried he'll snap someday and show up at my house or my job to kill me. I have security systems and other means of protection, but I still get paranoid about it. I've talked to the police about getting a restraining order, but they told me there's no real grounds unless he starts showing up and threatening to kill me. So, I guess we'll see what happens. When I was about 13, I was waiting for the bus at the end of my driveway. I lived in the country and it was fairly light outside. I had waited at the end of my driveway hundreds of times, ever since I was a young child. Many times I even stood at the end of it by myself after my parents took off for work. That was not one of those days that I had to be home alone. But my mother did stay inside as usual. She suffered from a bit of a prescription drug problem, which oftentimes incapacitated her and left her unable to get up from the sofa. It was one of those mornings. As I waited, a silver SUV started to pull up on the side of the road, right in front of me. I stepped back a bit, surprised and giving the vehicle some space to park beside the road. We lived in a very small rural community, so it was not uncommon for random neighbors I didn't know to pull in and want to talk to my dad. However, this was a car I'd never seen before, and the people inside I'd never seen before either. Nevertheless, I shrugged it off. I decided to see what they wanted. I had never been taught about stranger danger or any of that. We didn't learn about these things in my community back then. They rolled down the passenger side window and revealed that they were an elderly couple. They were both dressed rather well, and seemed to be friendly. As the woman smiled at me and beckoned me towards her sweetly, I didn't get too close, but I did approach her. I wish I could say it was against my better judgment, but it honestly wasn't. I just didn't know any better. Are you from here? The woman asked. We need some directions. Yes, I am from here, I said. What are you looking for? Do you know where the feed store is? The man asked, before telling me he was from the neighboring town. I frowned. The feed store was a local place that farmers went, and every local knew how to get there. Even people in the neighboring town would know, so it was a bit strange for someone not to know where it was. 
but I just assumed they were old and forgetful. My grandma forgot where things were fairly often, so I thought it wasn't too strange. I gave them very thorough directions and assumed they would drive away, but they didn't. So it's that road right there, the old woman asked, pointing to a nearby dirt road. I furrowed my brow. I had stated very specifically that the first intersection was another few miles of the road, so I corrected her. The woman gave me a blank stare with wide eyes and shook her head. The man's eyes were starting to dart from her to me, and I noticed he looked uncomfortable. There were cars driving around them, and they did not seem to like that much, but I was too young to realize what was making them nervous. I assumed they were just desperately looking for the feed store. So it's that one, the woman asked, pointing to a different nearby dirt road. I nearly scowled, but I had always been taught to be polite to old people, so I shook my head. Then, the woman did something strange. She started to open her car door, smiling wildly at me and reaching towards me. She didn't get out entirely, but she shot a glance at a red car that was passing their car, which was still parked on the side of the main road. I took a few steps back and turned to look at the front door of my house, I rate with my mother for being too stoned to check on me. Why don't you just show us where it is? She asked, reaching closer to me. Suddenly, the front door of my house burst open, and there was my mother. Although she was still high, and certainly not entirely aware of the situation, I truly believe she had to have some sort of sixth sense to open that door. Because the lady quickly closed her door, and the old man floored the accelerator. They were gone, and they did not go anywhere near the feed store. My mother wandered outside in her pink fuzzy slippers, groggy and irate. She rubbed her forehead and gave me a strange look. Who was that? she asked. I don't know. They wanted directions to the feed store, I told her. They were just old people. My mother looked uncomfortable, but she accepted my answer and went back inside, undoubtedly to get high again. I got on the bus and forgot about the weird couple for that day, and for the next week, because nothing was out of the ordinary. Then, the Sunday newspaper came. My mother was high as usual, flipping through it in a very casual manner. Suddenly, her face became pale. At first, I thought she was overdosing, which I had unfortunately seen before. I rushed to her to make sure she was okay, but it was not an OD at all. Her eyes were wide and full of horror, and all she did was point to an article. It was not a big article. It actually took up a part of the newspaper, not much larger than a single obituary or wedding announcement. However, the content was life-changing. As I looked at the article, I saw four very small pictures. Two were the old man and woman that I'd seen a week prior, and the other two were of a small boy and girl about my age. I had hardly even thought about that encounter until that moment, and what I read terrified me. The couple had been caught in the neighboring town. They had lied about their location claiming they were from a town slightly nicer than the one where the newspaper said they were found. I noticed that immediately. Then, the article went on to say that they had been keeping a young boy, only six years old, in their basement. He was in diapers, being starved and abused. And if that wasn't disturbing enough, there was also a girl. She was fourteen and emaciated but she looked a lot like me. She had the same blonde hair and bright eyes. I imagine she probably looked much more like me once, before she went through what she did. The couple had supposedly locked her in a closet. They starved her and abused her. The girl lived astoundingly, but the article didn't go into detail regarding her physical and mental health. I cannot imagine what that poor girl went through. I'm just thankful that I never joined her in that closet.
Once upon a time, long, long ago, I worked in the pizzeria, Papa Murphy's to be exact. One night, when I was 16, I was closing with my 15-year-old co-worker, who we'll call Leah. Around 15 minutes before closing, somebody called in an order and we made the pizza. Then comes closing time, and nobody came to pick it up. So we stored it and locked the door, turned off the open sign, the lights, and everything else. Five minutes after close, a lady comes up to the door and starts pounding on it. We don't open it because we're closed, and we aren't legally obligated to open the door after we've closed. A few minutes later, the phone rings, and I pick up with a typical, Hello, Papa Murphy's, we're currently closed. And on the other side, an angry lady yells, Excuse me, 20 minutes ago I called in a pizza, and I came to get it. But you locked the doors. I can see you right now. I'm never giving my money to this establishment ever again. And she hung up on me. She pulled out of the parking lot and left. Cool, whatever. And then and there I was like, Oh shit, what the hell is she doing back here? But you know, I was tired and I wanted to leave. So I told Leah to continue cleaning and not worry about it. Fast forward to 20 minutes later, and the stupid car is still there. What in the world is this woman doing? Why is she here? Leah and I were in a bit of shock, so we called our managers and explained the situation. They said to make sure we lock the doors and leave together. We agreed and finished cleaning. After a while, my manager decided to pay us a visit and check out the store and stuff. By now, it was nearly an hour after closing time. We were supposed to leave half an hour after close, but we were too scared because the car was there. So my manager told us they scoped out the car, and there wasn't anybody in there. It was strange as hell. Me and Leah were pretty shaken up, but we just decided to leave and get out. When I walked out to my ride's car, I glanced at the car and it was true. There was nobody in there. On the car ride home, I was contemplating the situation. It was just so bizarre. But then I realized that in the small outlet mall where we were located, every store around us had closed hours ago. We were always the last to leave. So, where the hell did this lady go? There was no other store she could have gone in. She parked directly in front of our store, in the spot closest to our door, but she wasn't in her car. She left after she got mad, then came back, and now she was gone. Maybe my managers found out, but I'd bounce because I was really not trying to get shot up or assaulted, or worse. From now on, I've always been wary of salty customers. It was Thanksgiving 2011. I was celebrating at my grandparents' farm in the small town of Seville, Florida. I had way too much to eat that holiday and was about to leave to drive back to school in Tallahassee. I stopped at one little gas station in town to fill up before getting on the highway. I had just finished filling up when a lady walked up to me. She was really ratty looking with crazed blonde dyed hair. But this is the backwoods of Florida so no judgment. There were really kind people who looked like that in those parts. She started talking to me about how her car had run out of gas, and if I could possibly give her some cash to get home. I usually don't say yes to things like that, but it was Thanksgiving weekend, so I was feeling extra generous. I told her I'd be happy to fill up her car a bit to get her home, and that's when it started getting weird. She kept insisting that I give her cash, and that her car was so empty she couldn't drive it to a pump. I don't know why I didn't leave it right then and there, but again, I was in a very good mood. I told her if she had a gas can, I would put some in, but I didn't feel comfortable giving her cash. She kept objecting, but eventually went over and pulled a gas can from her car. I started filling it up. She put her hand on me and said, Do you have a girlfriend? I told her no, politely. She said she wanted to pay me back somehow for the gas, 
and then asked if I wanted to come to her place. I told her no less politely. She kept touching my shoulders, thanking me, and then offered for me to join her behind the station. So I stopped the gas pump, got in my car, and left her there with the gas can. I called my mom a bit later and told her about the creepy, sleazy encounter. She paused and asked me if this lady had ratty blonde hair and looked like she was using drugs. I confirmed that yes, that was what she looked like, and how could she know that? This lady was apparently all over the news. She was a prostitute in town and had been at a party earlier. An exchange had gone south. Her baby had been kidnapped by a client of hers and left under a bush in town. She hadn't even bothered to call the police about the missing child until later. They were both arrested and charged. I hope that this story helps someone step out of their comfort zone and end a situation before it begins. I was not as firm as I should have been due to this occurring in a business setting. Please, learn from my mistakes. I own a small business. The weekend before Thanksgiving, I was a vendor at a local market. I was set up next to a father-daughter woodworking duo. The father told me what their relationship was and that he made the items and she hand-painted them. I had never met either of these people before, and they were new to the market. It was a four-day market, and the vendors are all really friendly. Just after settling in one day, the father of the duo took up to talking to me, with the friendliest of vendors in mind. The fact I was a similar age to his daughter, him being 20 plus years older than me, and him telling me lots of dad jokes and old guy jokes, it didn't strike me as weird. Had I not been there in the business capacity trying to work with customers and focusing on what I was doing, I would have caught the signs that he was going to be an issue before it got too far. I would have shut him down from the get-go, but I didn't, and he would not stop talking to me. And I do not say this lightly. When I didn't have customers, he would talk and talk non-stop. He kept asking me personal questions, which I avoided like the plague. I tried to work on making some items while we were slow, turning away from him, trying to deter him from talking to me, but it didn't stop him. No amount of ignoring him turned him away. If he was in the middle of saying something and a customer came to my table, he would interrupt or talk over the customer, or even over me talking to the customers. He would come over, stand in front of my table, and block customers from physically being able to get to it, and he'd talk. He stepped in front of customers to talk. He also tried moving my product around because he has OCD and my colors needed to be organized better. I organized my table by product, not by color, or nobody would find anything because everything would be all over the place. He was chasing off my customers and bordering on the line of creepy. I kept my customer service voice and asked him to go back to his table to please stop talking and allow me to work not to touch my stuff, that kind of thing. He didn't let up. I should have been ruder to him, but I was so concerned about customers hearing me speak curtly to someone because they won't know what's going on. I would end up sounding like the ignorant one. I act much differently when representing my business than I do dealing with this sort of thing on my own. He eventually took to asking me if I was single. I didn't really answer him one way or another because I wasn't thinking clearly. I kept trying to ignore him, that's all I could think about. I tried to talk to his daughter a bit, who seemed perfectly lovely, but he wouldn't let me without interrupting. The one thing I didn't see him do during the entire four days was actually talk to one of his customers or help them. He completely ignored his daughter, his own table, everything. Now that I look back on it, it was a somewhat obsessive behavior, but again, I was wrapped up in trying to handle my business and didn't catch it. By the first day, I was drained. I came in early on the second day, specifically so I could rearrange myself. 
My chair had previously been on the side closest to his table, with my bags for customers and my work bag on the other side. I moved everything between his chair and mine. I moved my chair as far away from him as I could, without getting out from behind my table. It did nothing to stop the situation. It may have actually made it worse. It just made him talk louder. By the middle of day two, I was fervently texting and trying to find someone to come fill in for me, as he continually asked me who I was texting, as if it were his business. Being the weekend before Thanksgiving, I was unsuccessful. Feeling like I had no other choice, I went to talk to the event organizers, in hopes that someone may not have shown up, and that there was an empty table somewhere that I could move to. They told me there were no empty tables. I professionally told them what was going on, and that he was impeding my sales, being inappropriate and bothering me, hoping for a solution. They would not do anything. He and his daughter had paid for their table, which I fully understood. I wasn't expecting them to be removed, but I was hoping something could be done. It got so bad that I made sure they weren't renewing their table for the Mother's Day event before I renewed mine. If he and his daughter were going to renew, I was either not going to come or I was going to be asked to be moved when renewing my table. Usually, when someone renewed, they got the same table each time. I made it through all four days by ignoring him as much as I could. However, as I was trying to pack up, he came over to my table and kept standing in my way. I'd go to get a crate. He'd see me move toward it and stand in front of it. I'd go to put something away, rinse and repeat. I'd had enough. The event was closed. The organizers were aware of the situation, and I'd lost some of my knives. I flat out told him to go back to his table, help his own daughter, get away and just leave me alone. He seemed to take the hint. I packed up in record time, throwing things in boxes just to get away from him and get out before he changed his mind. I thought that was the end of it, but we wouldn't be here if it wasn't. I was home for about an hour when I got a message on my business Instagram. It was him. It said, I hope you don't mind, but I got your information off your business card. There's one major red flag with this. And I keep my business cards under my booth where I sit, so I can put them in bags and hand them out accordingly. I never gave him one. I never would have. The only way he got one was to go behind my table and take one when I was in the bathroom. He went from being completely annoying and somewhat inappropriate and creepy to straight up creepy. He then proceeded to go on a multi-paragraph rant about how he had no friends and knew immediately we were going to be best friends. He also told me there was an obvious spark between us and he couldn't believe he found his best friend and soulmate. He wanted to know when he could take me out on a date after all the sexual tension over the last four days. I was floored. I did everything I could do over those four days, short of telling him to shut up and go back to whatever level of Dante's Inferno that he came from. And out of all of it, that is what he took out of it. I flat out told him that I was not interested. I did not feel the same way or enjoy talking to him over the weekend and that he was not to message me or attempt to contact me again, or he would be immediately blocked. Long story short, I gave him the same spiel multiple times and had to block him on my Instagram, ban him on my business Facebook page, and block him through my business email. Thank God I don't put personal information, like my name and phone number, on my cards. Now he's taking up bothering me on my Etsy, the last possible place he can, I told him the same thing and sent his messages to spam, but he seemed to figure out that he can keep messaging me on Etsy and I can't block him. He's still messaging me, even though they're all going to spam. I finally had to report him to Etsy Trust and Safety. I hope the resolution is that they will block him. He's causing me panic attacks and I'd really like to move on from this. Him not taking the hint no matter what I said did make me afraid that he would find me on social media, seeing as he knew my first name. 
the rough area I lived in, and what I looked like. Since he had a very unusual name, I found him on every social media site I could, and I preemptively blocked him just to keep myself safe. I did find one very important thing while doing so. When I went to block him on Facebook, his entire profile was public, and he liked to post about every single thing he did. I took a moment to scroll through his feed, simply to try to get a feel for it if I could feel he could be violent or not. With one very quick scroll, I found out that almost every single thing he had told me was a lie. For one, the girl he was with wasn't even his daughter, and he wasn't involved in the business in any way. Granted, he was the one who told me that, and she wasn't around when he said it, so she probably had no idea I thought this, and that's probably why he wouldn't let me talk to her without interrupting. She was his niece, and she and her husband made the items. He was helping her in her husband's place. I kept screenshots of his messages, and also the things on Facebook that contradict them. God forbid I need them to file a police report. I've already chatted with my friend's friend, who is a local police officer. The laws in our area are really for the stalkers. We have a really high rate of deaths here at the hand of stalkers because of this. I was told that, because he used my business information, which is public, regardless of how he got it, and I could not do anything. I had to wait until he moved into my personal accounts to file charges. I'm currently working to find out if there's loopholes to that, because what he's doing cannot be okay. It feels so strange that it could be legal for him to continue to harass me, even after being told no, just because it's a business page. I've also gotten a P.O. box for my business a few towns over, in case he has a friend order something from my shop, for any attempt to get my address. I was very forward in my last message with him, prior to reporting him, that any personal contact, or any contact in general, would be considered as harassment. I'm going back to the next market. I'm worried about showing up to it, or any other events, because I do have a website with lists of my events so my customers know where to find me. I have kept every correspondence with him and every message where I've told him no. I have screen caps in my phone in case that fails. I typically only do larger events that have a police presence, and if he approaches me at an event, I fully intend to take those messages to one of the officers and show them that I've told him several times to leave me alone. And the last time, I told him exactly why I wanted to be left alone and what he was doing was inappropriate, so I had a written record. I'm hoping if the police see him show up to an event I'm at, and proceeds to talk to me after he's been told no, that it will be considered stalking. I'm also working on getting a large male friend of mine to come to my events and help me out. I'm hoping this all ends here, and that he'll end up disliking me, and decides he deserves better than me, and that I'm not worth his time but I worry if he'll try to find me or retaliate. I don't know what's going to happen, so I've documented accordingly. Last Thanksgiving, I was driving home from college with my friend. I live in a very isolated part of Arkansas. That requires driving an hour through hairpin turns in the mountains. There are lots of blind turns, and the whole time you're driving on the edge of huge drop-offs with no barriers. I'm usually pretty confident driving through the mountains, but we were in my friend's car, so I was going slower than usual, driving about five over the speed limit. Almost as soon as we started the roughest part of the drive, another car was tailgating us pretty close. This was stressing me out, and as soon as I saw somewhere I could pull over, I did. I pulled into a church parking lot, and my friend offered to drive the rest of the way, but I declined as it was completely dark, and she'd never driven this route before. We get back on our way, and a few minutes later, I have to come to a screeching halt, as there's a car stopped in the middle of the road. It wasn't on the shoulder at all, just stopped dead in the middle of the road. My friend was saying that they must have broken down, and they can't call a tow truck because there's no service in the area. I immediately have a bad feeling and lock the doors. 
I tell my friend to stay in the car no matter what. She is starting to get scared at this point, and points out that it might have been the car that was following us. I can't tell, but I am very scared at this point. It's parked right before a hairpin turn, so I can't pass it. My friend starts frantically telling me to go ahead and pass, but I don't want to get hit by a Mack truck or fall off the mountain. I honk my horn. Nothing happens. There's no chance of calling for help as there's no cell service. We wait there while doing nothing. My friend is crying and freaking out, but I'm too scared to try and pass them. I honk the horn a few more times, and eventually a guy gets out of the car. He walks around to the back, leans against his car, and just stares at us. My friend is freaking out even more, and I'm just frozen. I tell her not to make eye contact. I'm ready to floor it if he does something, but he just stands there, staring. He's not checking his car or anything. I try to stay calm and pray that another car will come along soon. This goes on for what seems like forever, but it was probably only 15 minutes or so. He is just casually leaning against his car, looking at us. Eventually, we see car lights in our rear view, and the guy jogs back to his car door and gets in. He speeds off, going dangerously fast, so there was nothing wrong with his car. I start driving, not wanting to cause a wreck. We don't see anything else for a while, but we pass the same car parked along the highway a little while later. It pulls back on and starts tailing us again. I try to speed up and get rid of him, but he keeps following. We have cell service at this point, but I don't know if we should call the cops because nothing really happened. I call home and tell my brothers what was going on and tell them to wait on the porch for us. The car follows me all the way home, down the really long drive to my house. I get to my house, and my two brothers are waiting on the porch, holding their deer rifles. I pull in, and the car just goes off the end of the drive, loops around, and speeds off back the way it came. We tried to see the plates, but we couldn't make them out. My friend and I were really freaked out, but when I told my other friends the whole story, they didn't think it was a big deal. This happened a while ago, maybe five or so years. I've lived in the woods with the same neighbors my whole life, never once had any issues here. It was the kind of neighborhood where we left all our doors unlocked 24-7, so I never had any reason to feel unsafe here. So it was during Thanksgiving break in high school, and my cousins were staying with us for a few days. My cousin and I hadn't seen each other for a while, so we decided to go take a walk one night and catch up, and talk about things we couldn't say in front of other family members. As we were walking back, a van passes us, and I tell my cousin to just step off the road a bit into the woods, in case the van doesn't see us, and accidentally hits us or something. So the van passes, and we go back onto the road. Then I hear it come to a screeching stop. It starts backing up fast. We're only about 300 yards from my house, so I tell my cousin to run as fast as she can. I remember trying to take out my phone to dial 911, but my fingers were so cold and numb, I couldn't even get my iPhone to unlock. As we were sprinting back, the van suddenly stops and then starts driving away again. Thank God, because I really thought we were going to be kidnapped. I'd even seen the van before on my street which made it even more unnerving. It was windowless and had a lightning bolt on the side of it. I have no idea why it stopped or why it decided to back towards us, but I'm just thankful that something made them decide to stop whatever they were going to do to us teenage girls that night. In January of 2016, my grandfather lost a long and grueling battle with brain cancer. He passed on a peaceful evening in hospice care. The days and weeks that followed were dreamlike and surreal, 
as I'm sure anybody who has lost a loved one can attest to. But we knew he was no longer suffering, and we could always hold on to that. This, however, is largely a story for another day. In late February of the same year, my wife and I discovered that we were pregnant with our second child, due the week before Thanksgiving. The months pass, and we prepare to bring another bundle of joy into the world. The due date approaches, but no sign of a baby. One day, it must have been late November, my dad calls me and tells me this. Your baby is going to be born on December 14th. I remember scoffing at this and thinking that it would never happen that late. That would be over a month overdue. Our last baby was born a few weeks early, so I had reason to believe that would be a trend. How do you know? I asked him. All he would tell me is that he knew it would be December 14th, and that he would tell me why after she was born. Weird, right? On December 14th, 2016, at approximately 5pm, we welcomed our second daughter into the world, after what ended up being just over a 10 month pregnancy. I wasted no time asking my dad how he seemingly knew the birth date, and his response froze me. Grandpa told me. When he was alive, I asked. No, the day that I called you, he told me in a dream the night before. My dad was never a believer in the afterlife or heaven or anything like that, but to this day, he stands by his conviction that my grandpa spoke to him in a dream and revealed the birth date. And you know what? I believe him. There was such a sense of calm that evening as we drove home and nestled in for the first time as a family of four. Could everything have just been one giant coincidence? It's certainly possible, but I like to think that there's something much deeper at play. I like to believe that he really is watching over us. Maybe that's naive, but so be it. So on to the story. This all happened in August 2017. I was 23 and just moved back into my mom's place, which happened to be a 30 minute drive from my nearest friend's place. My car broke down, so I had to Uber everywhere I had to go. I went down to my friend's place to help them move. I went to Target to grab some champagne and orange juice, because apparently I hated myself and thought an imminent hangover was a great idea. Fast forward to that night. And of course I'm doubled over, throwing up with a migraine, and can barely lift my head. I have to work the next day's morning shift. My friends have no idea where they have any sort of over-the-counter medicines for headaches. But of course, the stoner of the house offers me an edible. Now, I may have killed the bottle of champagne, but I haven't touched that stuff in years. I ate half of that edible and waited about 45 minutes to feel better and called my Uber. I was getting picked up in an apartment complex, and of course had to walk out to the front to find the driver because I've never met an Uber driver that can locate any address with accuracy. I get to the back seat and he turns around to introduce himself. This guy has a southern draw that would make molasses seem like water. It was at this moment I realized I messed up. I told him I had a migraine and just wanted to go home. He pulls out a bottle of water that was already opened up and some random pills and tells me they should make me feel better. So of course, I politely grab them, and then proceed to stuff them in the seat, and shove the water bottle in the pocket in front of me. We begin our 30-ish minute journey to my mom's apartment. If it weren't for Mary Jane coming along for the ride, I probably would have hopped out right there. This guy starts off the drive by telling me prison stories and then somehow it delves into how the world's going to end by December 20-something of 2017. Every few sentences, he's now bringing up his bunker. He asked me constantly if I just want to head there instead of home. My high-ass self kept telling him I'd love to, but I have work so I can't. Maybe next time, I guess. He's cycling through conspiracies, from the Earth is flat to Kandahar, Afghanistan giants. He says, I probably shouldn't tell you this, but look up Kandahar, Afghanistan on YouTube. 
Also, in case you all didn't know this, the world isn't heliocentric. Just get a pair of binoculars, you'll see. According to him, at some point, he's telling me that he has an arsenal of guns. He grows opium at his bunker, and again asks me to come with him. I'm panicked, texting everyone I know, sharing my location, and started a recording. I managed to get about 7 minutes in total of this 30 minute drive on film. So we're getting closer and closer to the exit he needs to take to drop me off, and he's still in the far left lane of this four lane highway. I kept telling him to move over, and the exit is coming up, and this creepy ass man keeps telling me how well stocked his bunker is. He misses my exit. Finally I lose it. I start screaming at him to get me home and that my mom is waiting for me and I have work tomorrow. He finally does get off the exit after I start kicking his seat, threatening to jump out of the moving car. I ran out of the car so fast when he hit the red light outside of the apartment complex. As soon as I got inside, I tried telling my mom what happened, but she brushed it off. She was far more disappointed that I told her I had taken an edible. The next morning, I coherently explained what actually happened, and I showed her the videos. We reported him to Uber. I still take Ubers on occasion, but I will never use one while alone or inebriated ever again, and this is the reason I don't consume THC. The universe knows when I'm high, and things like this happen to me. So about six to seven years ago, my family of nine moved into this new house, closer to town. I was about 14 to 15, just during my freshman year of high school. We didn't know much about the neighborhood, except that it was right next to a nice big Catholic church, like nice nice. The church is so close that you can actually see it from the yard, and walk to it in a couple of minutes from the house. So. We thought it was a nice quiet neighborhood. Well, one morning, I'm getting ready with my siblings to go to school. Our neighbor we had at the time was a little weird. We didn't know much about them, but they hated that we had dogs that barked a lot. So there were a couple of times he had threatened to shoot them, which led us to giving them away because we were afraid for their safety and that the police wouldn't do anything. I had only seen the neighbor once or twice, and he was a rough looking guy. I guess he was in his late forties, very skinny as if he was on meth or something. Anyway, I was the first one out the door that morning to wait by the car that was in the driveway. I was standing only about three feet from the road because I was walking around and waiting for everyone else. The only other person outside was my twelve-year-old sister who was behind the gate. As I was walking back and forth at the end of the driveway, the neighbor's car came speeding down the road and started to slow down when he saw me. Keep in mind, I didn't know everything about this guy that I know now. I didn't know about the level of creepy this guy was. I just saw him as one of the neighbors. My parents didn't tell us about the reason we had to give our dogs away at the time, and I was a very ignorant and clueless child. So he slows down and he's smiling at me and his car came to a stop only a few feet away from where I was standing. He then pulled out a bag, just a plastic bag, that looked like it had something in it. It also looked like it was bagged a couple of times over. He told me it was for my brother, who liked to play basketball. We had a basketball hoop in our yard. I asked him what was in the bag, and he told me it was a basketball. Right away, I got this incredibly sick feeling in my stomach. And at the time, I didn't know why, but the feeling I got from this guy made me feel incredibly uncomfortable. He asked me to come get it so I could give it to my brother. I was hesitant, because if it was just a basketball, why did he have so many bags around it? So I asked him if he could just throw it over, and around this time, my little sister that was outside with me had gone inside and told my mom that there was someone outside. When he saw my sister leave, he started to get out of his car. Before the man could say anything, my mom had come out the front door and was standing on the porch, asking the neighbor what he was doing, and without saying anything, he jumped back in his car and floored it down the street. 
I cannot imagine what would have happened if my sister hadn't told my mom or even been outside to see what was happening. To this day, it still gives me chills. We never saw him again after that, and he moved away a few months later. So let's start off with some backstory. My parents had shared custody of me until my dad started working away. So I moved in with my mom. She lived about two hours away from where I lived with my dad in a pretty shitty suburb, plenty of drug abusers and alcoholics. I was 12 to 13 at the time, maybe younger. The man in this story will be Craig. Craig was my neighbor. My house was at the end of the road. In between mine and Craig's house was an empty house. Craig's house was about the same size as ours, but he had about 10 people living there. They were aboriginals, so it's not unusual to have so many people living in a small house. It was about 8.30, and one of my small dogs had gotten out of the house and run down the road. So me, being the good firm mom I am, went out to look for him. I called for him a few times until I started to panic. Craig sat on his lawn drinking, with plenty of empty bottles beside him. I was on my lawn when he stood up, and he stood in the center of his. Craig waved me over, telling me to come closer. So I did. I walked closer. He told me he had my small dog in his backyard, and if I didn't hurry up and get it, he was gonna kill the mongrel and hang it all over my house. I was so in shock, so I walked closer. Then, one of the women I lived with came running out. They told me to get away from the man. I snapped out of it and basically ran inside of my house. What happened was, my dog had basically done a lap of the neighborhood and came up right next to our house. He dug under the fence and into the backyard. One of the other women I lived with heard him bark, so she asked the others if I was still looking for him. That's when the lady called for me. This was back in November of 2018, and it takes place in North Carolina. I was 14 at the time. My family and I had just moved across the states. We had just gotten to the city where we planned on living after a long road trip. We were all hungry, so we decided to grab dinner before we went to pick up the keys to our new house. We went to this local pizza shop. Since we had our dogs with us, and we hadn't moved into our house yet, we decided to eat in the car. I'm a pretty fast eater compared to the rest of my family, so I was finished way before them. After I was done, I decided to bring my puppy out to do her business. We were standing just a little ways from the car, playing in the leaves on the ground. I grew up in Florida, so I wasn't used to seeing piles of autumn leaves. I was just living my best life, not paying attention to my surroundings, when a man taps on my shoulder. My dog notices him and immediately tries to jump on him, as she does with anyone. So I pull her back while I'm backing away from him. He looks to be in his mid-40s to 50s. He smiles creepily at me, like it was forced. He says in his scruffy southern voice, You have my dog, my border collie. Immediately a red flag goes off in my mind, as my dog looks very obviously like a boxer, nothing like a border collie. Now let me tell you, I'm horrible at confrontation, so I just nervously say, I think you're mistaken, sir. This is my dog. I'm not even trying to tell him how my dog doesn't look anything like he was saying. I look over to my parents' car that was just a couple of feet ahead of me, unsure of what to do. They hadn't even noticed the man approach me. They were on their phones. The man now asks me, Well, would you be able to help me come look for my dog? I can feel my stomach drop in that moment. I still don't want to make a scene, as I'm probably overreacting, but I've read my fair share of kidnapping and sex trafficking horror stories, so I have an idea in the back of my mind on what's going down. He then says something along the lines of, I have some money in my truck for you, saying it was mine if I went with them. My hands are sweating at this point. This is something straight out of a Reddit thread. 
He points over to a very sketchy, run-down looking truck. I tell him I'm busy and have to go, but best of luck on finding his dog. I'm still trying to keep him on my good side. Looking back on it now, I don't know why I didn't tell him my parents were right there. If I would have, I think he would have backed off. I overly worry about what others might think, so I was just trying to be polite and not make him mad. He then decides to grab my dog's leash and says he had dog treats in his truck and starts to walk away with my dog. I pull the leash away from him and I said sternly, I have to go now. As I start walking away, he then grabs my wrists and rips the leash out of my hands, throwing it to the ground. He starts pulling me with him, mumbling something like, just come see what I have for you. My dog, the sweet girl she is, follows us after and starts barking while he starts to drag me with him. I'm pretty small, 5 foot 4 and no upper body strength so I start to scream to let go of me. My parents, now alarmed hearing me scream, and our dog, chasing after me barking, see this man pulling their daughter against her will. They immediately start sprinting after me. I start screaming, Mom! Dad! I think he got alarmed when he heard me yell out for my mom as she starts running towards us. The sudden realization that my parents were right there in their car the whole time he makes a run for it, and we didn't run after him. My parents were just glad they had me. This is definitely not a good way to start our new life in North Carolina. We hadn't even lived there a day yet. I do not wish this to happen to anyone. It was terrifying, but my advice for you is don't be afraid to use your words, even if they offend the person. I just moved into a new neighborhood, and I'm starting to get really worried. My neighbor, who I don't know at all, comes outside every night when it gets dark, and stares at my house with a creepy look. He doesn't move during this staring session, and it typically lasts about 20 minutes to an hour. I have called the police about the situation, but they're not much help, and I don't know how to handle this situation on my own. One time, I tried staring back at him and he just wouldn't budge. I went and knocked on his door one time. The house was eerie silent, and there was no answer. When I returned to my porch, I turned around, and he was just standing there in the window, looking at me with that creepy stare. I've been here a few months, and he doesn't miss a single night of doing this. One night, I was taking out the trash, and he was just standing there at the end of my drive, staring at me. I said hello and what are you doing? He just stood there and wouldn't budge. He didn't say a word. I walked away because I felt like something was going to happen. I live alone and I'm 45 years old. I don't have any pets. I don't have any floodlights or security. That is about to change. I don't own a firearm and I don't have the money for one at the moment. I asked a few people about this guy, and nobody knows anything. He does have a car in the front yard, but it doesn't look like it's moved in years. I have never seen the guy leave his house unless it was to come over and stare at mine. He looks to be in his early 40s. I have only seen him in the daytime, and that was when he was staring at me out of his window. He only seems to come out at night. I work during the week, so I'm unsure if he's outside during this time. The police say they can't get involved unless he steps on the property, which he has not done so far. I will be getting an alarm system installed next paycheck. If you guys only knew the way this guy looks at my house, it has honestly freaked me out, and I do not have the option to move. This is a nice neighborhood. I didn't expect to be scared to death. It's like something out of a movie, and I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go for help. I'm scared to approach him because of the stuff that's happened so far. Hopefully, I can find a solution soon. I've always been borderline obsessive about locking my doors. 
I did it as a kid, and as a teenager I learned through experience that a locked door is at least a deterrent and can give a warning that a person wants to illegally enter their space. And it's something I'm known for. Even at social gatherings, I'll lock the door behind me when I come in without even thinking about it. I've heard the line, well who the hell locked it? Followed by that flush of embarrassment, because of course it was me and now I have to say it. For a decade I've done nightly checks, because I can't sleep without doing so. Knowing this is a preface to my story, and highlights how strange the situation is. I've just only moved here recently, about five months ago, from a way more heavily populated place in my state. The house where we reside is set far back from any pavement road, separated by two dirt roads and two private driveways. I've never seen a pedestrian back here. It's nice and very private. No one can even come here without explicit instructions, and often I still have to meet them down the road, as GPS places my house a few fields to the south of where it really is. It's a paradise for people like me, who value their privacy and don't like having visitors without prior notice. The house is semi-surrounded by trees and brush, with a field on the other two sides. It took a bit of getting used to the rurality of it, hearing coyotes often, sometimes cows screaming in the night, and the darkness of having no nearby sources of light pollution, but we get used to it. Another relevant tidbit, I don't sleep in complete darkness, I always leave lights on in a common area, usually only one, but a light nevertheless. The back door leads into the trees, so it didn't feel so creepy, as a few yards in there is a six foot tall wire fence, laden with vines and offering a further modicum of privacy. No one uses the back door, there's really no reason to. A month in and I found myself locked out, I knew I had only locked a handle on the back door and figured I could just pop it to get myself in. I checked the door out and it was pristine. None of those minute scratches that are present when you take a flat metal object and pop the lock on a cheap door. I didn't want to damage it, so I swallowed my embarrassment and called the landlord, admitting that I'd locked myself out and needed back in. He came and let me in, and I worked on being more mindful. A little more than a week later, I wake up thirsty. I walk groggily to the kitchen, and as soon as I open my bedroom door, I realize it's way darker than it should be. My ever-burning light is out. I wonder briefly if there's a power outage, but I can hear my fan behind me in the room I just vacated, so that can't be it. I take another step, and the hair stands up on the back of my neck. That feeling that someone's watching. Another step, and it's beyond feeling. It's a conviction. I turn my head to the left, where instincts say the person is standing and for a split second, I'm relieved. No one is there. In the next instant though, that relief abandons me, as I notice I can see stars where only darkness should be. My back door is wide open. I take two very fast steps backwards, out of the view of anything that could be in my backyard, knowing I'm responsible for people's safety than just my own. I don't retreat for long, Almost immediately stepping back forward and further, I have to shut the door, of course. The entire path there, I just know someone's out in the darkness, waiting until I'm close enough to snatch. I reach out into the pitch darkness for the knob, expecting to feel a hand close over mine at any second. After a moment of panic-driven fumbling, my hand makes contact with the knob and I pull it shut with a slam. I go to turn the lock and find it still engaged. Maybe, just maybe, this once, the door wasn't completely shut, like maybe the latch hadn't fully engaged. The turned off light remained a mystery, both of my boys said it wasn't them, and that's very believable because they've never done it before. Both of them liked having a light to find the bathroom and such, so I just write it off as strange but nothing else was amiss, so I guess it was just one of those things that'll never have a full explanation. From that point forward, 
I put my weight into the door any time I check or lock it, from my rare but occasional trips to the backyard. Life goes on, and I almost put it to the back of my mind. Until almost three weeks later, I wake from a nightmare, mouth dry, bladder throbbing. It was one of those bad ones where you wake up making inarticulate sounds, trying to scream from a sleep-paralyzed mouth. Deja vu. After my bathroom trip, I emerge into a dark kitchen. Two steps in, someone's watching. Door is wide open. I panicked, quickly retreated, followed by a fear-fueled moment of bravery where I rush forward and close the door. Sure at every moment that I'm about to be torn out into the night and slaughtered. Strange. I know for sure that the door didn't pop on its own this time. What is going on? My adrenaline rush finally crashes as I lay in bed after, trying to figure all this out. I've left my bedroom door open this time so I can hear anything going on in the house, and I finally fall back to sleep with two hours to spare before I have to get up. When I get back up to wake my boys up, I'm halfway to the coffee maker before I see it. The door is open again. This time, no real feel of being observed. Lights still on in the kitchen. I do what I already should have done and check the door and jam for evidence of tampering. There's new scratches and bend marks where the aluminum gave when being pried. At least this means it's not a ghost. I don't really know what to do. Life goes on. Two weeks after that, the chickens pen 30 feet or so from my bedroom window, crow long into the night. Even the hens are part of the show this time. The hens are making eerie little screams. It makes my sleep fitful, not very restful, and I wake up at 2am when my fan goes off. It powers out. Damn. I get up to utilize the latrine and to light a couple of kitchen candles to save anyone needing to get up in the night from traversing the house in the darkness. Two steps in, cue the hair on the back of my neck, and this time I can hear the crickets before I even turn my head. The door is, of course, open. After I survive another door shutting, I spend a lot of the day thinking about this. There was more damage, scratches and gouges in the jam this morning. I try to rationalize how this can possibly be happening, and I can't think of anything that makes sense. Any innocent reasons I can attribute to it go out the window when I remember this has never happened even once in the daytime. I think maybe I missed the scratches, that they were already there and my paranoid brain told me they were worse, which could be feasible. All except for the day that I got locked out, and I remember that it was in such good condition that I didn't even have the heart to pop the door myself. I decided to change the deadbolts around. The front door has a square cord lock. The back has a sloping one that I'm honestly sure is actually backwards in the door. Work picks up, and life moves on. That night I'm exhausted, I can't find my Phillips head. So in place of changing the locks, I put an errant Christmas decoration adorned with bells to place on the door handle, and then I go to sleep. For once, I'm in bed early, and I fall off as soon as my head hits the pillow. Cue the nightmares. This night, I wake up the first time at midnight, on the dot. Dark kitchen window, and the back door open. I fall back to sleep, wake up at 1.30, Door open. Wake up at three, and to my enormous relief, the door is closed. I go back to sleep and ride into a nightmare. In this nightmare, I can hear Christmas bells. I come upon a little girl with her back turned to me, and in that weird nightmare logic, I am at first not afraid of her. I ask her what her name is. She responds with, Someone's coming. Someone's coming chanting it over and over. She starts to get louder, and after a few crescendoing repetitions, she turns to me, jaw on her chest, mouth unnaturally wide, and screams, Someone's here. 
I pop awake. It's five and a false dawn shines faintly through my window. I immediately get up to check the door. Of course the kitchen is dark. The door is open, but surprisingly no feel of being watched. It feels like the danger is past, like gun smoke in the air after the main event is past. I close the door, and to my absolute horror, I turn to find the Christmas bells laid neatly on my dryer, no longer attached to my door. I talk to my boys that morning. I ask them about anything they had heard during the night before. My 13-year-old says, Nothing. Not at all. Except... No. Wait. I got up at 2.30 to pee and the back door was open. I shut it. I ask him about the bells. He's pretty sure they were there, on the handle. I switched the locks. And a few days ago, there was more damage to the door. But so far, the lock is holding. So, creepy door opening stranger, let's not meet. First things first, let me mention that this is one of many paranormal experiences I have experienced in my life. I have always been highly sensitive to what I believe are spirits, and have a plethora of events I could discuss at length. This one, however, is one of the most memorable I've ever experienced, and incidentally, one of the scariest. I'm not particularly brave, I can't stomach scary movies at all, but somehow, I end up being too curious for my own good, and end up in scary situations. Go figure. With that said, on to the main event. Back in 2007, age 19, I moved from my hometown to the nearest big metropolis to attend university. I had spent most of the previous summer working two jobs, including one at a medieval store, part of a bigger chain. We sold outfits, swords, jewelry, gargoyles, and all sorts of figurines and knickknacks. I had been a really good employee during my tenure, and when I told my manager I was moving and had to quit, he very kindly mentioned that one of the stores from the chain actually needed an employee, and that it was right in the city I was moving to. Needless to say, I was pretty thrilled. He forwarded my CV to the manager in the other store, and she replied that she'd gladly take me on as soon as I moved. So, summer goes by. I moved to the big city. And in September, I start working at the new location. First, let me describe the surroundings a bit. The store was located in the oldest part of town, and considering the city is 375 years old, those buildings have a lot of history. The street was long, narrow and cobbled, very busy in the summer, swarming with tourists. The store was on the bottom floor of a tall, very narrow building. The top floors were occupied by a busy bar. There was only one door, spilling out directly on the street, flanked by a big display window where we put mannequins dressed in our wares. The very back of the store had another mannequin-adorned display window, but no door since the street parallel to ours was actually 35 inches below. That part of town had been built on very sloped land, so every street going down the river was lower than the other. This is pretty important, so remember that. The minute I stepped into the store, I felt something was off. It was stifling in there, like the air was heavy. I was immediately uneasy, but couldn't exactly spit on a job that paid well, where I knew what to do and quite well, and that worked out with my student schedule. So I buried my concerns and got to work. I got along really well with my new co-workers, became good friends with the manager, the money was good, things were going swimmingly, but I was feeling on edge whenever I had to work alone or close up the shop. The store was dark, long and narrow, lined with gargoyles, mirrors, swords and mannequins. You had to go all the way in the back, in the storage room, flip off all the breakers, and then head back all the way to the front of the shop in pitch black darkness, just to get out on the clothes. 
Needless to say, I pretty much sprinted out of there as soon as the lights were off. Now, well and good, we could chalk all this uneasiness to the actual decor and architecture of the place. But not once did I feel any of that in my old store back in my hometown. And it had also been in the old part of town, in a truly ancient building. Nothing tangible happened for a month or two. I was feeling weird and uneasy, but I couldn't say with any kind of certitude that something was actually there. And then, around late fall, stuff started happening. I was opening the store one morning, and as I entered the shop, a massive gargoyle that had been on a shelf at least 16 feet up was in the middle of the floor, like it had been put there on purpose, facing the door. And that was not a lightweight gargoyle. Needless to say, I was a little unnerved. After that initial event, I would find stuff misplaced all the time. Things finding themselves in weird places. Figurines in our bathroom. Things on shelves switching places. Hanging things crashing to the floor with no warning whatsoever. And then there were the steps. The floor of the store was old, worn hardwood that was very creaky and unforgiving. The lightest weight on it would make it crack and creak in the most obvious way and it would start cracking all the time, even if no one was stepping on it. There are many instances of hearing steps when I was just standing behind the cash register, doing my thing. One night, I was working with my manager. Let's call her Jay. I let slip that weird things were happening. I was expecting her to laugh and reassure me that I was making things up, but the face she made definitely let me know that I was not the only one experiencing things. She spilled everything to me. She told me about things moving, furniture rattling, steps, things flying off the shelves, and feelings of deep uneasiness. The unsettling thing is that Jay is one of the least spirit-sensitive people I know, and even she was freaked out. So right there and then, I had confirmation that at least some of my experiences weren't completely outlandish. I worked there through the winter, Things had stabilized in some way. Stuff was still happening, but I had started to get used to it. It would just be mildly annoying when I'd come in in the morning and find things in odd places. By the time summer rolled around, however, things started escalating. Whatever was inhabiting the space had decided that moving things wasn't enough. It decided to start messing with us. Not just with me. All of the staff started experiencing things. Even my manager, with the sensitivity of a teaspoon and the most skeptical of employees. An employee I'll name C came in one morning, and as she was sweeping the floor by the changing cabins that were covered in large mirrors, she swore she saw a figure that definitely wasn't her in the reflection. When I got to work later that day, she was standing behind the cash register by the door. She looked very shaken. She hadn't moved all day, too scared to get close to the mirrors, and honestly, I didn't really want to either. She told me how she'd brushed off all the little things, but that was definitely something she'd never experienced before, and she was really freaked out. Another employee, E, was definitely not the scaredy type, a big guy, very skeptical in his ways, and definitely scoffed at our concerns. Well, one night, as he was closing with our other male employee, H, he felt a very cold, very solid hand in between his shoulder blades, pushing him. It was the most physical the entity ever got with one of us directly, actually touching one of us. I find it very interesting that it picked one of the most skeptical out of all of us to manifest itself like that. In any case, he was seriously freaked out. He tried to explain it away, but of course, how do you justify an ice-cold hand pushing you in the middle of a store, with nothing near you? He was very tall too. He towered over all of us by a head. Whatever touched him had to be tall too. H, who was present, and standing behind the cash register, was a good 12 feet in front of E, and he didn't see anything touch him. H, incidentally, had one of the scariest experiences. It happened the summer before I started working. On a busy night, he was wrapping something for a client behind the cash register counter. 
On the wall behind the register, we hung swords. It was the most structurally sound wall, so it made sense to hang the heaviest swords there. They were permanently locked in heavy custom-made brackets with padlocks. You really had to want that sword for us to unlock it, because it was a pain in the ass. For no reason whatsoever, one of the swords fell out of one of the brackets and slashed his face. Out of nowhere, we kept those swords religiously locked. The odds of someone leaving the bracket open were slim to none, and even then, they were very heavy swords that needed some force to get out of the bracket. Poor H needed to get four stitches on his cheek. He was never the same after the accident, and he was very affected by the vibe in the store. I think he was highly sensitive, and definitely picked up on the negative energy in the store. He quit the following summer because he'd just become too scared of working on his own. Needless to say, I absolutely didn't want to work by myself either. The only one who seemed unaffected was M, the most skeptical out of the whole staff. M would literally burst out laughing and make fun of us whenever we spoke about things happening, saying things like, It's an old building. Things settle. The walls are soft. Someone with a spare key is pulling a prank on you all. That kind of thing. She was not believing anything and thought we were all collectively freaking ourselves out. I think that her dismissal either angered or bothered whatever was haunting our store, and it may have explained some of the escalation of events. The entity got more aggressive. It started literally breaking things. We'd come to work to find things shattered, and stuff would hurtle off the walls and come crashing down beside us. We'd hear furniture rattle in the back store, and played rock, paper, scissors to find out who would have to go in there to turn off the light breakers at night. I was so terrified that when I closed, I pleaded with my boyfriend at the time to come get me so I wouldn't have to close on my own. I was once locked in there during my shift. I was rummaging around for a box and the door slammed behind me. The key, which I'd sworn I'd brought with me, was nowhere to be found. Thank God my manager Jay was there with his spare keys to let me out. This also happened to her, and to E as well. We were all on edge, except for M. Until one morning, I got to work and M was already there. She'd gotten there early to chill and eat breakfast, but when I got there, she was standing in the back of the store and was looking a bit freaked out. I asked her what was wrong. She told me that when she'd gotten in, there had been that heavy feeling to the store, like the place was crowded with bad energy. She tried shaking it off, but could not for the life of her feel good or truly alone. She'd felt watched and was not liking it one bit. I think that the fact she was actually physically feeling it was what freaked her out the most, and sadly for her, the feeling never really went away, so she also quit in late summer. She was feeling on edge every time she worked, and not like herself. She said to us that she felt that if she stayed, she'd go crazy. That definitely did not cheer us up. Our staff was up and leaving en masse. We were scared to work, saw things in the mirror, and even my notably spiritually insensitive manager was feeling like she was going a little insane. Things kept being weird and intense all summer, and subsequent fall. Even clients picked up on the vibe. One woman refused to get in the store, claiming that there was something in the store that didn't want us there. That freaked me out so much. I felt cagey and on edge all day after that. I was jumpy. I had nightmares. I slept like hell. I was also in uni full time and working full time. I was exhausted and really over it. By the time winter rolled around again, I was ready to throw in the towel. Christmas came and went, and after that, it got really dead in our part of town. I live in a very snowy, cold winter climate, and most of our clients were summer tourists. Business literally went dead after December, until at least March. So I spent entire days alone at the store, with one or two clients on my entire shift. It was awful. I was waiting to land another job to quit. But then, something happened that was a proverbial cherry on the cake. One fateful February day, I'd gone to work knowing full well that I probably wouldn't get a client that day. 
It was dark, gray, snowing and windy. That day was full on storm mode. I wondered why I even bothered showing up. It would have been smarter to close that day, but my manager was working with me, and I decided I didn't want to leave her alone. So I get to the store. It's dark and gloomy in there. My manager is there, already kind of throwing a fit. When she looked at herself in the mirror, when she'd gotten there earlier, she felt like she wasn't looking at herself. It's hard to explain, but she had the distinct feeling that it wasn't her in the mirror, staring back. I'm not sure if that makes sense, but I immediately understood what she meant. She kind of lost it and started yelling at whatever was here to leave us be and stop messing with us. It had basically just happened as I arrived, and for the rest of the day, we were both jumpy and on edge. Of course, there wasn't a single client. It was mid-afternoon, dark outside because the sun sets early in winter, so it was dark indoors too. It was just miserable. We were sitting in the middle of the store, lacing a big pile of bodices we'd gotten earlier that week when we heard one of the tables in the back of the store rattling. When my manager went to check, she called me over. An entire display of small leather pouches that had been painstakingly arranged on the table had been tossed right off. Small pouches everywhere. The table was askew and long scratches had been gouged into the surface. Not deep by any means, but they were there. We were freaking out. That's when I noticed the mannequins in the back display window. They were facing inside the store and not out as they should have been. She asked me if I'd move them today, and I obviously hadn't. The only time we would actually move those was when we changed their clothes. No one could possibly have moved them since the only door to the store was all the way on the opposite end. I then noticed that every single mannequin in the store was actually turned towards us, including the ones in the front display window. How or when that happened, I'll never know. I have no explanation to this day. If it was a prank, it was so well orchestrated, I'd wonder what kind of mastermind had this much time to waste, scaring the hell out of a little team of hapless teenagers and young adults just trying to get by. My hands are shaking as I type this. To this day, it's one of the scariest things that has ever happened to me, realizing that all the mannequins had been turned towards us. I still get major shivers whenever I tell people about this experience. I felt watched and so unsafe. It was horrifying. My body was in fight or flight mode, and I felt physically ill. I had to get out of there, and not a minute too soon. That's pretty much when I decided that it was enough. I pretty much told my manager, Okay, that's it. I've had enough. I'm leaving this place and never coming back. Screw this, I'm going home. She didn't want to stick around either, so we grabbed all of our stuff and left right there and then. Didn't turn off the breakers. Didn't do any of the closing procedure. We got our stuff, put the key in the door, and hightailed it out of there. I never went back. The owners decided to close for the remainder of the winter the week after. We all received unemployment benefits until we found new jobs. And when they opened again in April or something, I told my supervisor when he called offering me a job that I'd rather die than set foot in that store again. I walk in front of the old building a few times a year when my errands take me to the old part of town. They closed the store permanently a few years ago, and to this day it remains vacant. I ran into the barmaids and waiters that worked upstairs a few times. We'd often chat on our respective porches when we'd go out to smoke back when I worked there. Last summer, I was walking on the street below the shop and ran into one of the barmaids. We started catching up and she was telling me about how our old store was still vacant and that whoever visited it to open something in it would back out of it last minute or change their minds. I decided to bite the bullet and asked her if anything strange or uncanny ever happened in the bar, at the risk of looking a little strange. She looked at me with big eyes and nodded. All the time, she said, chairs flying, bottles shattering, barmaids and waiters hearing weird sounds at night, 
doors closing on their own volition, and a plethora of others. We exchange stories for a good hour. I'm quite convinced that the entire building is haunted. It wouldn't be surprising in that part of town where most buildings are 200 plus years old. I never quite knew what it was that was there, what its motivations were, but one thing was sure, it definitely did not want us there. Let me mention that I'm a scientist at heart. I would never label myself as a skeptic by any means, but I do love a good logical, scientific explanation. If I could have debunked any of the events mentioned, I gladly would have. But there are no words, and not a single explanation I could possibly have for the horror, sense of dread, and events that unfolded when I worked there. And even now, nearly ten years later, you could never pay me enough to set foot back in there. Not in a million years. I'm a 23-year-old female of decent attractiveness who works in the cellular industry on the front line in sales, which means I run into all kinds of people in my line of work. I used to work for a different cell phone company for a few years. I left the industry for about a year and a half, and just two months ago, got back in, and I've already had my first obsessively creepy customer. So John comes into the store when I'm in the back room, and I'm still technically in training at this point, so I'm not shocking customers even a bit, but I see that no other employee is free except my manager, and managers aren't supposed to sell to customers. So I walk into the sales floor and hover close enough to hear the conversation, knowing that if no other employee frees up before this guy's ready to pull the trigger on whatever he's doing, that's going to be me. I hear my manager and John talking about prepaid plans, and very quickly I catch on that this guy may not be playing with the full deck of cards. I had an off feeling about the guy right off the bat. My manager and John decide on a phone, and my manager starts walking to the back to grab it, making eye contact with me, telling me to follow. When we get into the back room, my manager fills me in that this guy's a bit older and a little crazy, and he just wants me to get the guy in and out as soon as possible. He hands me the phone and walks back out with me, staying around because I don't fully know what I'm doing systematically at this point. John allowed me to go through the order, getting a new line for him, choosing his plan, and making sure everything is good. I'm making small talk at this point, like with any customer, but he keeps bringing up how terrible this world is, and how he's sure he's the only person who doesn't do dope in the world. One of my co-workers had a question from my manager so he had to step away. As soon as my manager stepped away, the guy starts telling me that I'm such a pretty girl, but it was in this really unsettling tone. My manager overheard, finished up with my other co-worker, and came back over to me to kind of keep the situation under control. I brushed it off a little because I've had weird compliments before. Way weirder than that by far, and I finally got to the screen where his total was. Well, when I read his total, he starts talking about how he has 400 something dollars in the bank. And, isn't that a lot of money? He has this personal banker who's going to give him more in the morning, but he didn't have a card, so he was going to need to go to the bank. He looks up at my manager and asks if I could drive him back to the bank, since it's only a couple of blocks away. Of course, my manager informed him while on the clock. Employees are not allowed to leave the premises for liability issues, but he asked a couple more times, more insistently, until he gave up and said he would be back. Honestly, we thought he wasn't going to come back, as the conversation from him kept getting more and more strange. We really thought he didn't even have the $200 for the new phone and plan. A few hours go by, and the store is still relatively busy, so again, when he comes back, I'm the only person without a customer. We start up the order again, because yes, I had to cancel the whole thing when he couldn't pay for it originally, and I start to go through the exorbitant amount of screens my company has us go through for the one line. Of course, he starts talking again, and this time, 
He's talking about how he's not allowed to have a driver's license anymore due to a DUI in another state and how it's crazy to him that people can get a license again after getting a DUI and how his DUI wasn't even due to drugs or alcohol. A cop made up the whole situation because he had it in for him. Then he says, look what I got on my way back from the bank. He pulls out a bottle of Coke and a half a bottle of vodka. I'm trying to be nice with my oh yes and that's too bad, but he keeps droning on and on. Then he starts asking me if my manager is my boyfriend. And I responded immediately saying, no, my boyfriend's a cop, in a forceful tone, which wasn't entirely true because it's actually my best friend who's a cop and I don't have a boyfriend at all, but I thought the statement would make him back off. I'm struggling to get through all the screens because I don't exactly know what buttons to press yet, seeing as this was the first time I was doing it by myself. And he starts asking even more personal questions, like where I live, or are my parents still alive, and do I have a relationship with my dad? I wasn't giving him enough information to go on, just enough to not be rude. And then, he reaches out, grabs my hand and holds it. I pulled it away to finish the transaction and my hand was sticky where he had touched me. At this point, I'm starting to get angry because I don't like people touching me anyway, but this guy was such a creep. I finally get to the payment screen and take his cash and as I was about to send him on his way, he asks me to set up his phone. He grabs my hand again, holds it and then shakes it. I was too shocked to really do anything besides pull away, and then he started telling me what a pretty girl I am again. And then, he starts telling me he bought that vodka because he's alone in his hotel room tonight, which is right down the street from me, and asks when I get off. I shrugged and said, whenever these guys let me go home, because I didn't want him to know I was closing. So then, he asks me what time I would be in the next day, I lied and told him I hadn't checked my schedule yet for the next day. He grabs my hand again while I'm setting up his phone, and he tells me, I'm one of the good people in this world, and I'm very beautiful. I got chills up my spine, skipped through the rest of his phone setup, and again tried to send him on his way. He didn't leave, and instead wanted to show me a song on YouTube, and wanted me to set up his OK Google so he could have it play music by voice command. I set it up and he turned on the song, but he wanted me to hold the phone while we watched the video, and he kept looking at me to make sure I was watching it. I don't remember what song it was. All I remember is that it was a horribly made music video, back from when music videos weren't really a thing. He grabbed my hand again and shook it, holding it for a good 30 seconds before I was able to shrug my hand out of his grip. I handed him the phone and told him to enjoy his night. He said, thank you, pretty lady, and tried to grab my hand to kiss it, but I got it out of reach before he could. I felt so dirty, my hands were so sticky, I literally washed them for 20 minutes after he left. And when I finally went home, I was still shaking. I took a scalding hot shower and scrubbed my whole body raw with a loofah. I feel like he could have been mentally ill, possibly self-inflicted from the dope he claimed so many times not to do. He probably didn't intend any harm, but my boss felt terrible for leaving me alone with him that whole second interaction. Before John left, he asked me if I could pay his bill in the store. I informed him that it would be so much easier to pay it through our app, as a nice way of saying, hey, creepy new prepaid customer, let's not meet again. This happened not long ago, and I haven't been able to take my mind off it. On President's Day, I went to Bed Bath & Beyond for a few kitchen utensils and a bathroom storage bin. As usual, I go out with my husband and two kids, a toddler and a young boy. We started out in the kitchen area just to get what we needed, but ended up slowing down and taking time to see things, since my toddler was asleep in the car. As I'm looking around, 
My husband decided to go to the restroom, and that's when I first noticed this man, in his late forties, didn't have a card or anything, just kind of hovering. For a moment, I thought he knew me, or just wanted to help. But being an introvert, I know how to avoid contact. So I just go to the next section and wait for my husband to get back. As I'm looking around, I notice shoppers move past me, but this man just seems to be a few steps behind me, just hovering. At this point, I start to feel paranoid, but it subsides as my husband came back not long after. Now at this point, we're at the clearance section, and I see him behind us, so I tell my husband, I forget to see something. He is now with an employee, and we walk past him. The employee is explaining something to him, and I can feel his creepy gaze. I mention this to my husband and told him I wanted to go. So he tells me to get the kids in the car, and he'll pay. So I walk quickly outside and buckle my kids in, and I'm just waiting for my husband to return. As I am waiting in my car, I see that creep walk past our vehicle. But not long after, my husband is right behind. He packs up the car, and we head out to Walmart for our last trip of errands. We head in to get something at the deli for a snack and go to the pharmacy, and we see that creep yet again. This time, I knew it wasn't a coincidence. I decided to give him the slip. I got my kids and husband and sped walk to the most crowded area, and that turned out to be the makeup aisle. I peeked through the aisles, and I saw this man looking around. He put back his item and pulled out his phone, heading out the exit. I recently learned of some chilling details about a person that was heavily involved in my life as a child, and I thought I would share the story. Throughout my childhood, I was extremely shy and did not find myself going out of my way to make friends in new settings. I had recently started preschool at my grandmother's church, and I remembered being on the playground by myself when a woman introduced herself to me. Her name was Candy and she looked like any other sweet old woman. She almost reminded me of my own grandmother with their abundance of white curls on her head. Candy was a volunteer at the church and typically watched over the other children while they played, so we would see each other fairly often. I can't remember much about the start of this friendship, but I presume one thing led to another before I was frequently spending time with her in and out of school. My parents were grateful to have someone who was interested in watching me, as I was the youngest of three, and my parents worked full time, while also taking my brother and sister to and from school, sports, or friends' houses, so having a helping hand was a blessing for them. To be honest, I don't remember too many details about spending time with Candy, but I suppose we spent our time frequenting ice cream shops, parks, and that kind of thing. I do have one memory of going to her house, where I had never seen before. And as she was showing me around, I remember passing through a dining room and seeing another girl who looked to be around 10 to 12 years old. Candy introduced me to her and told me that she lived down the street and would spend a lot of time at her house. I'm not sure why, but I remember being jealous. I guess I was jealous that Candy also cared for and spent time with another little girl. I had never felt that way before, and I'm not sure why I remember that so clearly. For some reason, that was the only time I went to her house. Fast forward a few years, and I am now in the first grade. I had totally forgotten about Candy, and had not seen her since I graduated preschool two years prior. My neighbors, who I carpooled to school with, had dropped me off at my house after school one day, and I spotted a Target grocery bag hooked to our front door. I wasn't sure what it could be, or why my brother and sister didn't bring it inside when they arrived home from school an hour or so before me. Once I took it inside, I noticed writing on the back, indicating there was a gift inside for me from Candy. I ran up the stairs to my room, and to my surprise, there were several adorable brand new outfits inside, just for me. I immediately tried them on, and was so excited to show my mom when she came home from work. After my mom got home, I eagerly showed her the outfits that Candy had left for me. Unfortunately, 
my mom wasn't as excited as I was. In fact, she was quite angry. She yelled at me to take them off and that she would be returning them to Candy. I was so confused as to why she was so upset with me. What did I do wrong? These were free clothes. A gift. Wouldn't it be rude to return a gift to someone? To avoid being punished, I put the clothes back in the bag and handed them over to my mother. We never spoke of this again, and Candy slipped my mind for the next several years. A few years ago, my sister was home visiting from college. And with nothing else to do, we decided to go to Target for useless things we didn't need. As we were walking through the parking lot, the thought of the Target bag from Candy randomly dawned on me. I proceeded to laugh and ask my sister if she remembered, and if she knew why Mom was in such an awful mood that day, to force me to give the clothes back to Candy. My sister stopped dead in her tracks and said, Wait, do you not remember what Candy did to us? Taken aback, I shook my head and begged her to tell me what happened. She refused to talk about it and told me to ask mom. Once again, the thought of candy slipped my mind and I didn't remember to ask my mother about what happened until I was in college a few years later. We were saying goodbye to my grandmother after grabbing lunch when she mentioned to my mom that someone's funeral was that weekend and they sat in silence for a few minutes, just staring at each other. After my grandmother left, I asked my mom who they were talking about, and she informed me about Candy's death. The realization that I had never heard the true stories about this woman crossed my mind, and I asked my mom about what my sister refused to speak on. My mom proceeded to relay the horrible stories to me about the little old woman that tried to take me away from my family. At the beginning of their friendship, Candy genuinely was a big help to my family, and was someone that they trusted. However, Candy's intentions were questioned by my grandmother, who shared a few of her concerns with my father. After hearing some odd stories from her friends at church, she felt as though something was off with Candy, and she didn't like that I spent so much time with her. Coming from a woman who never had a negative thing to say about anyone, my father became slightly wary of Candy, but he assumed that my grandmother was just being overly cautious. After some time of Candy watching over us and babysitting me, her demeanor changed, and she started acting possessive of me and became hostile towards my parents. She would show up unannounced to our house asking for me, and if I wasn't there, she would become incredibly angry and yell at my parents about how awful they were. She would continuously tell them that they didn't deserve me, and only she was worthy of taking care of me. This happened several times before my parents told her to stop coming to the house, or they would call the police. This inclined her to start calling the house and leaving messages for me, which my parents obviously would not tell me about. In these voicemails, she would cry to me and try to convince me to leave with her and leave my family. She would talk about how awful my parents were and how she could give me a much better life than they could. The voicemails that were intended for me soon turned to threats from my parents. She threatened to call the police or child services to have me removed from the home and placed into her care. She threatened to tell the police about my parents' violence and abuse towards me and my siblings, none of which was true. Once she realized that her phone calls were not working, she began making efforts to show up at the house again. She started driving up and down our street day after day. She would ask our neighbors and the neighbors' children if anyone knew I was home or where I was. She would park her car and watch our house without anyone really noticing or saying anything. Eventually, our neighbors began recognizing her car and what was going on, and they would inform my parents when she came around asking about me. After some time of doing this, she took it upon herself to come to my front door while only my brother and I were home. He was only like 10 years old at the time. She started banging on the door and begging to see me. My brother opened one of the front doors, keeping the storm door between them closed, and he told her to leave. She proceeded to plead with him to let her in, and he replied that I was not home. Despite me napping soundly upstairs, Candy partially forced herself through the door when my brother put his hand in her face, pushing her out of the door, and told her that the police had been called. She left after that and distanced herself for a while, before the final straw with my mother. 
One day, my mother and I were backing out of the driveway to attend my birthday party when Candy pulled up behind our car, blocking us from leaving. She came up to the window, and my mother rolled it down, ready to tell her off for good. Candy ignored her and looked right past my mother into the back seat, where I was sitting. She said to me, Would you rather come with me and never see your mom again? I love you so much more than they ever did, and can give you everything you want if you come with me. This was the final straw for my mother. She never thought that she would upset or fight with an older woman, but the day had come when it was absolutely necessary. She screamed and yelled at her, making sure to include that Candy would regret the day she ever came into contact with me or my family again. Something she said must have actually scared Candy, because she drove off and didn't appear in our lives again, until the Target back incident. I'm not sure how I never knew that any of this happened, and never thought anything was weird about her as a child, but I guess my parents did a good job of shielding me from the horrors of the situation. After hearing about everything that took place, I assumed that there must have been a reason that she became so obsessed with me. Did she not have her own family? Did she lose children or grandchildren and wanted to find someone to fill the void? According to my mother, she had several children that were much older than me, as well as young grandchildren. Thus, I'm not sure what would have sparked her interest in me. But thankfully, we no longer have to worry about her. Part of me still wonders if I repressed any memories or conversation with her. That was upsetting. Did she privately talk to me about how awful my parents were, or how she wanted to take me away from my family? Did I ever agree to leave with her? I also wonder if as I grew older and joined social media like Facebook, did she ever search my name? Did she ever watch me when I was in middle school, high school, or even when I went away for college? I have so many questions, but I am so glad that we never found out if she was going to follow through with any threats. As a word of advice, always trust your grandmother's instincts about other grandmothers, and do not befriend the old woman volunteering on the playground. And finally, to the woman who made my parents' lives a living hell, let's not meet again. So this actually happened to me pretty recently. I'm still so shaken up by the experience, and promptly quit the shitty part-time job right after. I work at a retail store in a not-so-nice part of town, so the area isn't the best. Not many people come into the store, and even less people come in at night. One important thing to note is that the store doesn't have any cameras, nor does it have a panic button. So basically, anyone could do anything, and we've had many people steal things here and there. Looking back, this should have been my first clue to quit ASAP. Working this night shift was me, a very small girl, and my co-worker, who was basically the same height and build as me. We were joking around and playing on our phones, because it was 7.30pm at this point, and no one had come in for about an hour. Suddenly, a group of people come in all at once. Two men and one woman. As a side note about these people, they are all wearing black head-to-toe, facial tattoos, and were very confrontational upon arrival. The woman was very husky, and I was honestly very intimidated by her. Her friends were at least six foot each, towering over me and my co-worker, we're both five foot three. One of the men immediately asked us what our ages were, and complimented me on my smile. I kind of awkwardly laugh, and I try to be as kind as possible to get these people to leave fast. The woman basically corners my co-worker over in one of the aisles, so she's unable to walk over to where I am, which is right behind the counter. The woman is basically yelling at my co-worker, Asking her, why don't you hire me? I need work. Hire me. Pretty much scaring the both of us. While this is going on, one of the men walks over and blocks the door. The other man comes up to the counter and looks at all the $100 to $300 items we have stuck behind the counter and jokes to his friend about how he needs all of these items. He then turns to me and with a deadpan face says, give me everything. I awkwardly laugh and say, everything? He then says nothing and continues to stare right into my face five seconds more before repeating, everything. So I do just that, 
I start to take things off the shelves while he points to things, saying, Give me that, that, and that. He then stops and says, You never ask me how I'm going to pay for any of this. The entire time, his friends are saying nothing and standing while staring at me. The man then breaks his stare and laughs, prompting all of his buddies to laugh along with him, and states that they're going to come back. As soon as they leave, I make a beeline for the door and lock it. I call my manager to tell her what happened, and I'm begging her to let us close because I don't want these people to come back. As if on cue, they come back and yank on the door, and continue to yank on it. I tell my co-worker to run with me to the back, and we lock the backroom door and call the police. By the time the police arrive, they are gone. Nothing could be done because of the lack of any cameras in the store. The police stayed outside the store in their cars until we closed, and walked with me to my own car. Throughout this whole ordeal, no one was in the store besides my co-worker and I. My theory was that they were scoping out the situation before leaving and coming back with a firearm to actually carry out the robbery. Luckily I had locked the door the moment they stepped out. I don't like to think about what could have happened if I had just brushed it off and decided to leave the store open. I was shaking like a leaf when they left, and they hadn't really done anything at all. I trusted my gut feeling. So anyway, I quit that shitty job. Thank you for being the catalyst to finally push me to leave. Before I begin, this guy's been fired and the whole story took place months and months ago. So I was hired to work at this auto shop as a front desk receptionist. My guy friend had worked there and had gotten me the job. I checked customers in, checked them out, answered phones, entered invoices, blah blah blah. Now at this time I got hired, I was freshly 15. I do in fact act mature for my age and all that stuff but I was still technically a child. I was also the only girl working there. Now, my two managers, let's call them Peter and Alvin. Peter was my main boss and he had a dry sense of humor, but he was cool to be around. Alvin was more openly humorous and he was just very pleasant in general. And then there was this third guy. I'll call him Chester because I hate that name. He was 40 had a girlfriend, as well as a 13-year-old daughter. He was very exuberant, very loud. He was quite funny. He was also a dumbass. It started off decent. He would tease me like a boy on the playground, like pull my hair, poke me, that kind of thing. Now I laid my rules down when I first worked there. I hated being touched. That's that. Now Chester would get as close to me as humanly possible and say, I'm not touching you, followed by a laugh. I just laughed it off, although I felt uncomfortable. Then he started with inappropriate jokes. When we were alone up front, he would start talking about his sex life and pop a bunch of innuendos. My brain automatically said, this ain't right. I just kind of put on my customer service voice whenever I was around him. Then one day, I baked the whole garage cookies. When I dropped them off, he came really close to me and sniffed me. You smell good. And your hair looks nice this way. Hell no, I did not like that. When I went back to work, he was going on and on about the cookies I made. He said, I know cookie is another term for something inappropriate but I really like your cookies. Why even add that? And now, my breaking point. He had started brushing his fingers against my leg when I'm sitting down, or just trying to flirt with me in general. When I came into work one day, he grabbed me into a hug, and my mind blanked. He grabbed me, like grabbed me into a hug so I couldn't escape. I pushed him back away from me. Alvin had rounded the corner and had seen that happen and he looked uneasy. I went around the other side of the counter away from Chester, and I said, I don't like to be touched, dude. Do not hug me. And he said, well, touch is how I show my affection. So not only did he ignore my attempt to tell him to stop, 
He also admitted to literally giving affection to a 15-year-old. I later heard from my friend that works in the garage that Chester talked about the way I look a lot and how I look older than I am, but he doesn't want to start anything because his daughter was two years younger. Start what? So Alvin had seen him grab me. The guys in the garage heard him talk about me, and I knew this guy was creepy as hell. A guy in the garage, let's call him Steve, pulled Alvin aside and told him that he was worried for me. He told him what Chester had been saying and how he looks to be flirting with me. Before this point, Alvin had thought that he'd been too overprotective because he had daughters himself and maybe he was just having his father instinct. When Steve told him that, it basically confirmed his suspicion. Chester was gross. I ended up speaking to Alvin near the end of the day, asking to stay after to talk about something. We stayed after, and I opened up to him about everything Chester had been doing. Alvin said that what I do is more important work than he does. After that, I went home and felt nice that my boss cared for me like a human, and not just an employee. Peter, my boss, messaged me to say that everything's going to be okay, and that Chester will be handled. I ended up meeting with Peter's dad, who is the big boss, to tell him everything. It was very much like, we've known Chester for a long time, that kind of thing. But the big boss is a good man. He trusted my word more. I told him everything. He has camera recording of Chester grabbing me, and Chester was fired. The more traumatic thing to me was how Chester talked about me in the garage. It was disgusting. And then going back to the fact that he is 40, and I am just two years older than his daughter, that's disgusting. I'm sure that if I wasn't such a confident person, he would have taken advantage of me. He was very much acting like a predator and I'm very glad he's no longer part of the establishment. Guys, teach your daughters to speak up when people make her uncomfortable. Even the small things like weird jokes turn into something bigger. That's how it is for young women nowadays. Always enforce your boundaries, and never let anyone get away with being a creep. My girlfriend and I were months away from being parents for the first time, and we were both working jobs. I worked in retail as a key holder, and she was working as an assistant manager at a place in a local strip mall. After my shift one day, I took the deposit bag, wrapped it up in my work clothes, put all of that in a bag, and I went to walk the five minutes or so to my girlfriend's work. Just before I got to the door of the mall, a man came up and asked me if I could help start his car. He needs to get to work, but he can't do it himself. Now growing up, my family had cars like that, so I was like, damn air intake or whatever, and I said I'd help. We walk around the corner of the mall to where the car is sitting. That's the car I'm going to help start, I think to myself. So we just need to get in and I'll drive you to my car I need help starting, the man said. The hairs on the back of my neck start to rise. I've ignored gut instincts before, but this is a sensation that is very clearly telling me, ignore these physiological warnings at your certain peril. I explained to him that I thought this would be quick, and I have somewhere I need to be and I'm already late. I apologize and walk away from him into the mall, and I watch him leave in the car before going to my girlfriend's workplace. I tell her we're going to scrap our plans for dinner and make it home ASAP, dropping the deposit bag on the way. As we're crossing the parking lot to head to the bank in a roundabout way, we see the same guy who was in a hurry to get to work, slowly driving around a Target parking lot, just scoping people out. There is no doubt in my mind, I would have certainly regretted getting into a car with that man on that day. There is a good chance I wouldn't be telling the story today. If your gut instinct ever throws you some spidey sense vibes, Listen to your body. Here is a list of strange things that have been happening to me over the course of the last six months. The first thing that happened to me was receiving a message from a family member, or so I thought. 
I got a message through Facebook from a great aunt. I don't talk to her very often, but she is pretty close with other members of the family that I'm close to, so I wasn't surprised that she would reach out. I recently graduated college, so she asked me what I was up to now. I answered all of her questions as detailed as I could and tried having a good conversation with her. I gave like a brief area of where I live within the city, but obviously didn't give her my address because she didn't need that for anything. But I talked to her for a few days while she continued to ask about my personal life. Then, out of the blue, I try sending a message to her, but the messenger app won't let it go through. I'm not sure why I can't send the message at the time. I assumed maybe she deleted her account because it got hacked, or she decided to stop using social media. I saw this already happen once. My uncle had an account that got hacked, and so people were getting weird links in the messenger from his account. So he just straight up deleted it. Then he made another account and things were fine. I chalk it up to that and just move on. Then, a couple of months later, I'm scrolling through my messages on the messenger app, and I see those old messages. I figured I wouldn't need them anymore so I just delete them. I then decide to keep scrolling and delete other messages that I don't need anymore. This is when I stumble on another account with the same great aunt's name. I got confused and wondered if maybe she made a new account. But then I look at the messages and realize she had sent me a happy birthday message a month before the other account messaged me asking about my life. I realize there are two different accounts in her name. I click on the happy birthday message and it brings up her account. There are pictures on there from over 10 years ago. I message her and she tells me that she's always had that account and she's never used another one. So, I had told a bunch of personal details about my life to a fake account that was using her name. Even if it was a simple case of fraud, then why did they not ask any questions or even hint at something like that? All they wanted to know was personal details about my life. For the second occurrence, fast forward a couple of months later, and I decide to rent a garage from my landlord, which is next to my apartment building. I start parking my car in it, and a few days after I start using it, I wake up one morning to find that my garage door is open. For about the next month, I wake up, get ready, and go down to my garage and the door is wide open. This happens about once a week for a month. It happens on random days and usually in the middle of the night. I also want to add that I haven't accidentally hit a button and after this started happening, every time I closed my garage door, I watched it go down and made sure it stayed down. I have ruled out most logical explanations. The third time I found my garage door open, I realized that the light on my rearview mirror was on. It was like someone had turned it on and went through my car. The whole month this was happening, I never once found anything missing from my car or my garage, and it hasn't happened now for two weeks. Here's the third thing that has happened. My boyfriend at one point lost his keys. About three weeks ago, he was getting ready for work and realized his keys were gone. He ended up walking to work and had to leave our apartment door unlocked because he didn't have a key to lock up. When we got home that night, I made sure we looked all over the apartment to make sure nothing was missing and also look for his lost keys. Everything seemed fine. My boyfriend had found his keys in the garbage after looking for a bit longer. I don't know how they could have gotten there, but they did. After watching TV for a few hours that night, I realized we hadn't checked the balcony. I went to check the balcony door, and I couldn't see the lock on the door at first, because our screen door is in front of the sliding glass door. So I slide over the screen door, and notice right away that the lock is unlatched on the sliding glass door. I slide the door open a crack and peeked on the balcony, because I got nervous. I couldn't see anything, so I closed the door and locked it. I just want to mention that my boyfriend and I have a rule to always lock the door. I have never left it open. And the fourth thing that happened to me. 
Luckily, none of the other things seemed to have continued on. I completed some security measures. But yesterday, I was sitting alone at my mom's house and I got a phone call. I looked down at the phone and it said, no caller ID. I often get calls from random numbers, but not often calls like that. I usually never answer either, because it's usually some telemarketers. And I got this bad feeling in my gut, but I had to know who it was, so I picked up. It was a man on the other end. At first, he was just breathing for a long time. But after I had said hello a couple of times, he said hello back. But in this really creepy voice. It was almost like he was surprised that I answered. I asked who was calling. And he started creepily chuckling and asked me, Who are you? Like he was mocking me. I asked again who it was. And that's when he said something really creepy and disturbing to me. And that is when I hung up. This is the only phone call I've ever gotten like that. It just scared me to think how he could have gotten a hold of my number. But I just have this bad feeling that this could be related to the other occurrences.